Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Elihis. I can okay. hear you loud and clear from here. Okay, I can get Charles Sado. Let's just do sound check. Abdul Bako, good morning, Abdul Bako. Can you hear me? Unmute your mic and let's hear your voice. Abdul Bako. Abdul Bako, your microphone is muted. Okay. Sagzon, Sagzon, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Good morning. Good morning, Sagzon. Uh, let's see. Um, John Femi Adi, can you hear me? John Femi Adi, can you hear me? Okay, Femi is connecting his audio. Wale Baba from Abuja, can you hear me? Wale Baba Jordan FM, can you hear me? My, my DG. Good morning, sir. DG, Bureau for Public Service Reform. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, good morning, sir. Fine, thank you, sir. Say again, sir. Fine, thank you, sir. This is Adam, Adamu Yusuf. Can you join us? Can you join us on Zoom now? Everybody. Okay. Okay, because of the rain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So any if you cannot just try to join us. If you cannot join us, call back here and I'll put the phone on speaker phone so that you can do your welcome address at the right time. All right, thank you. That's a uh, uh, chairman of Kaduna Union of Journalists, Kaduna Council, experiencing some technical issues. I want to say good morning to uh, Mr. Dasuki Abiri, DG Bureau for Public Service Reform. If you can hear me, sir, good morning, sir. Mm -hmm. He's not hearing me. Your, your audio is off. Unmute your audio. Okay, we have Cosmos Ayakudo. He's already with us. Can you hear me? Good morning. I can hear you loud. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. All right, thank you, sir. And, um, Rebecca Sako, good morning. Can you hear us? Good morning, Bureau of Public Service Reform. Can you hear me? Good morning, sir. DG. Morning, Mr. Hayes. Morning, everybody. Good morning, sir. We are so happy to have you with us this morning. Thank, thank you. It's my pleasure. Okay. Uh, Dr. Badia Milafia will join us any minute from now. He's also having some technical issues. And uh, who else do we have? Okay. So in a minute, we will be starting off the whole discussion. Femi Adi, Femi, your microphone is also muted. News, News Embassy. News Embassy. Ephraim Ebene, News Embassy, can you hear me? Yes. News Embassy. Good hey, morning, sir. All right, good morning. You are also welcome to this town hall meeting. Yes, Adamu Yusuf, NDJ chairman, is also connecting to us. To us now. Now. Any any from from with us. Us. Okay, he, Yusuf Adamu is here with us. Uh, chairman NDJ Kaduna, good morning. Are you with us? Yes, good morning. How are you? Fine, thank you. It's nice to have you with us this morning. Yusuf Goje, are my you with us? Yusuf Goje, can we hear you? 
I'm with you, guys. All right. So, sir, just in a minute, we'll start up. There was a heavy rainfall in Kaduna, and it's really uh, affecting the internet connection. That's why we are having this little hiccup. But the technical well, team are well, working on it. And we're, we're praying, we're we're praying for me. We're, we're praying for, me, for more rain. <laughs> All right, sir. <laughs> I can see Bako smiling. I know, like in this part of the country, when there's a heavy rain, they will say Ruaya Jara. So here, the rain never spoils anything. When they say Ruaya Jara, that's for the benefit of um, cosmos now. Ruaya yes. Jara means the water has repaired it. So no matter the rain, it can never spoil anything. We can only say that. The rain repairs, it does not spoil. Yusuf Adamu, I'm sure yes, my yes. house is correct. <laughs> All right. Yes, it's uh, very correct. Okay, Ruaya <laughs> Ijara. All right. Ruaya Ijara. Okay, so Ango Bali in Victor FM. How far with the technical issue? So we talk by the last year. We establish it quick so that we'll just start up. Or let's use a, a different connection for you. Okay, it will be oh, it will be in order if we start up with uh, the national anthem because we are all Nigerians and we are trying to propose solution to a Nigerian issue and I would want to I would want Fanny Adi to lead us with the national anthem. Fanny Adi, let's lead with the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. After the count of one, two, three. All right. edition of Ground Zero Town Hall meeting. And this Ground Zero Town Hall meeting, we started conceptualizing it before even the advent of uh, the COVID-19 that the world is presently facing. We had planned it to be a physical meeting. Which, all right, be, because of the issues that comes along with the um, COVID-19, we couldn't hold the physical one, and we said we cannot wait forever for the COVID-19 to go because it seems as if it has become the new norm. So the show must go on. We must move on with uh, 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 the progress of our country, and this has to do with these key, critical key issues and key areas where many Nigerians are very concerned. If we recall, when this administration was coming into power, indeed, it came up with all vigor and energy and basically uh, 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 stating that the fights against corruption, insecurity, where an economy, at the economy, we are major, we are major areas that, they, that this administration said they were going to focus on if voted into power. And thankfully, they have come into power. It's five years gone now, because just last month, yes, on the 29th of May, it was, uh, they celebrated their, their five, fifth year of this administration in office. And now, we on Ground Zero have been looking at all of the promises made by the government, and of course, the areas where the government has come in, and of course, done one or two things, and uh, 
as in a democracy, we know that the media, which is my primary area, is always ready to hold both the elected and uh, the appointed to account in respect of the promises they made and or even when they have not made any promise, there are standard baseline that we expect from government or those that are leading us. And it is based on this that we said, okay, let's do a review of the five years that this administration has been in office and also look at where they have done much, where they have not done enough. And of course, let us propose solutions and suggestions as to how we can move this country forward. And it is based on all of this that uh, we put this town hall meeting together. And uh, the, 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 those that are invited to be part of this town hall meeting are those that we know we really add value to our discussion today. Because we would not just say we want to sit and complain in our own little corners of our rooms without bringing in experts, bringing in professionals bringing in also technocrats to add their voices to whatever we are discussing. And I believe that this town hall meeting is coming at the very right time because we are looking at um, being able to, uh, the outcome of this meeting, we are going to package it and pass it through the normal channels to get to those in office. Yes, while we were expecting that we'll be able to get one of the presidential spokesperson, unfortunately, they had an extremely tight schedule. That's why we couldn't get any of them. But that notwithstanding, we also have at least a public service worker with us here. In the person of the Director General of the Bureau for Public Service Reform, he's one person that um, has so much wealth of experience to share with us and why also telling us what the government has done and we'll be also looking at the way out of uh, our present situation or how to improve on what we already have. This and many more are the things that we'll be looking at today as uh, I want to officially welcome you all to the start of this town hall meeting. My name is Ehis Adon and Ground Zero is a flagship radio program on Invicta 98.9 FM, Kaduna. And um, the physical program would hold later of the day. The content of what we are discussing today will also feature as part of the radio program that would come up at 4 o'clock this evening, 4 p.m. this evening. So once again, I want to welcome you all and thank you for having time to be with us on these are uh, town hall meeting this afternoon. I can see that uh, Gloria Balasin has joined us. Gloria, you're welcome to the Ground Zero town hall meeting. Okay, uh, let's now invite, uh, okay, Gloria, you are welcome to Ground Zero town hall meeting. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Gloria is also a lawyer. Now, I would like to give a little, do a little introduction here. I will start from, uh, first of all, the, our, the DG Bureau for Public Service Reform in the person of uh, Mr. Dasuki Abiri. I want to welcome you this morning. He's a DG for the, of the Bureau of Public Service Reform. DG, you are welcome to the... the, the okay, uh, Dasuki Aribi, you are welcome to uh, the Ground Zero Town Hall meeting. We also have with us Mr. Cosmos Ayakudo. He is a Lego practitioner based in the UK and is one that's done so much research. If you go through his profile, he's one that if we start to uh, read out his profile, we may take the better part of the program reading out his profile. I want to say, uh, Dr. Cosmos Ayakodo, thank you for having time to be on the program with us today. Thank you very much indeed, Ahis. It's a pleasure to be joining you from London, England. 
and uh, think uh, this program is uh, much needed uh, at any time, and especially at this time. Uh, after uh, we, we are at a junction in the history of our country, and I think um, for us who are in diaspora, we are having, um, we are not, uh, we're not aloof. Uh, we are not aloof. People are looking at Nigeria because people believe Africa is the next frontier. I know that there's more to say, but uh, by way of introduction, I can tell you that I work in the center of uh, uh, legal, uh, commercial law and uh, legal research in the University of Reading. I also teach at the uh, Brunel Business School uh, of the Brunel University London. I also am an adjunct uh, lecturer at Aden University in the UK. I also teach in China, by the way, Nanjing, uh, the one of the universities in China. But uh, the point to make is that uh, we in diaspora are not aloof. We're looking in and I'm looking forward to a contribution today. Thank you very much indeed. And to my co-panelists, uh, uh, very good morning to everybody. Good morning. Thank you. All right. I'll then move to our next panelist. Uh, he is um, a comrade. Yeah. He is a president of the Campaign for Democracy. We, if you recall, before our present democracy that we have now, the Campaign for Democracy was one of those uh, civil society organizations that did fight for the, our democracy. And presently, Abdul Bako Usman is the president of the Campaign for Democracy. Abdul Bako Usman, you are welcome to the Ground Zero Town Hall meeting. Abdul. Yes, he's a uh, good morning. It's a pleasure being here. And uh, I am quite uh, sure that uh, today we'll be telling it to our leadership and uh, to the general listening public so as to really vent out our anger and uh, push forward to moving mountains into the right direction. I equally welcome my co panelist here and all that are involved into this uh, a conference meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to welcome the chairman of NUJ Kaduna and the person of Comrade Yusuf Adamu, the president of NUJ and the person of Chris Isiguzo, the, the president would have been here with us. I wouldn't know what technical issues he's having that he has not joined us. But while we are waiting for him, I'm sure he has a capable lieutenant in the chairman of NUJ Kaduda, in the person of Comrade Adamu Yusuf. Comrade Adamu Yusuf, you are welcome to join the panel this morning. Comrade, good morning. Comrade Adamu Yusuf. Okay, comrade, yes, your mic is unmuted now. Comrade? Hello, good morning. Yes, good morning, comrade. I believe the national president will soon join the, yes. the, the panelists. Yes. Yes. Uh, all right. I would also like to welcome comrade John Femi Adi. Comrade John Femi Adi is the secretary NUJ Kaduna is also another firebrand comrade. Comrade John Femi Adi, you are welcome to uh, the Ground Zero Town Hall meeting. Uh, good morning. I have my chairman on board, and I expected my chairman to do an opening pray, uh, an opening uh, preamble, sort of. But um, we have a president to the on board. Um, however, we would surely give you the unbiased analysis of whether he is put on board today. That is what we can guarantee you. All right. All right. Thank you so much. And um, the last but definitely not the least, we have with us here Charles Sado. He is joining us from the United States of America. Charles Sado, you are welcome to Ground Zero Town Hall meeting. Charles Sado, you are welcome to the meeting. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
colleagues, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I couldn't pass this all when you sent me the invitation. It's about 3 a.m. It's about 3.22 a.m. here in Minneapolis, and I had to stay up for this because uh, I'm not going to pass, let this pass. You know, I'm, I'm so happy with a couple things that have been said here, you know, particularly with uh, my comrade from, from the UK uh, and uh, Comrade Bako Usman and uh, Comrade Femi as well, that this is a forum where we're going to speak truth to power. Because if you're, if you're not power, this is all meaningless. And uh, I just hope that, you know, we have that platform to be able to say things they are and, you know, change our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Charles Sado. Um, we have someone from the from PEF, Perform, Engage, Reform, and Learn. It's uh, Estefanos Atao. Yes, yeah, good morning, Ahiz, and good yes. morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Ahiz, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for this session. Um, as a program that is working you know, reforming governance processes in the state. We're happy to be here and we want to thank you particularly for your effort in putting this engagement together. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Estefanos. We will be coming to the DG now. While we are waiting for Obadia Melafia, Dr. Obadia Melafia, I think the DG Bureau for Public Service Reform in the person of Mr. Dasuki I Arabi would want to invite you to present your opening statement. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Ehes. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it is indeed my privilege to present a good message at this uh, occasion of the first in the series of Ground Zero Town Hall meeting, which is to examine and review the performance of President Hamadou Buhari's five years in office with focus on it against corruption, insecurity, and inequality. This program has put together, uh, this program has been put together to give us the opportunity to discuss freely, analyze, and provide solutions our recommendations on fighting corruption, insecurity, and inequality in Nigeria. At the same time, giving citizens the space to air their opinions on these important issues. It will also provide opportunity for citizens to be enlightened, which is a line of the present government's uh, agenda of engaging citizens and uh, in line with the OPG agreement the government has signed into. A realization that many reforms implemented concurrently within the Federal Public Service. The government felt it was important to have a central organization that will coordinate monetary reforms at the federal level. That was the reason why in 2004, the Bureau of Public Service Reforms was created. Working with a team of resource persons from within and outside the Federal Public Service, the Bureau of Public Service Reforms have initiated several reforms around budget, uh, public financial management, uh, due, pro, uh, due process, procurement. We have cleaned up the personal pay record of the public service. We have uh, instituted and instituted the uh, IPPIs, which is Integrated Payroll and Personal Management Information System. Over the years, we have done a lot of institutional assessment and studies, which are all aimed at uh, restrengthening the performance of uh, public uh, uh, institutions. The Bureau of Public Service Reforms, in its implementing its mandate, will want to see a Nigeria with a well-functioning, effective, efficient, and social economic system. May I use this opportunity to mention the 11 priority areas of this administration, which are enhancing social inclusion by scaling up social Im investments, stabilizing the microeconomy, improving transportation and other infrastructure, achieving agriculture and food security, drive industrialization, focusing on small and medium scale enterprises, 
fighting corruption and improve governance, ensure energy sufficiency, improve health, education, and productivity of Nigerians, ensure energy sufficiency, improve access to mass housing and consumer credit, provide security for all citizens. This, if implemented, will lead to improve economy, enhance security, help against corruption, which is a line of the topic of this of discussion this morning. At this juncture, I would like to express our sincere appreciations to Invicta Radio for inviting us to be part of this uh, important occasion and for being part of all activities of the Bureau of Public uh, Service Reforms. I would like to thank all the panelists and guests that have joined us. Uh, I would like all the listeners to focus, to be objective, uh, and will be sincere and not to be silent on those that we think uh, uh, should be discussed. The role of Bureau of Public Service Reforms is to educate Nigerians on what government is doing and at the same time to get feedback and advise government on how they should improve on their performance. On this note, I would like to thank you and welcome all, all of you. Thank you. Good morning. Over to you, Ehefs. Yes, Yes, thank you. I was trying to unmute my microphone. I have a very large team here, and everybody has signed to do one or two other things. All right, thank you so much. You've had the opening statement from the, um, the Director General of the Bureau for Public Service Reform. And uh, having set the tone for our discussion this morning, I would like to, um, I, would like, I would like for us to do uh, sort of engagement where every person would be able to add their voice to our conversation as the conversation is going on. Now, for the presentation sent in by the Director General of the Bureau of Public Service Reform, we are working on sharing it so that while the presentation is on, he would be able, uh, every other person would be able to see the presentation. And that's what we, uh, what we are working on and trying to pull out of the system, but it seems to be leaching. Okay, let's come back to our discussion. At this point in at this point in time, at this at this point in time, we want to take basically the welcome address and uh, to do that would be the chairman of NUJ Kaduna. Let him give us his welcome address and also his his keynote speech. Adamu Yusuf, it's over to you now. Adamu Yusuf. Okay. Okay, let's go to Gloria Balasin to also give us our own welcome address. All right, Gloria Balasin. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, you're Do you welcome. hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. All right. Uh, thank you, Ahis, and thank you, Invicta Radio and the Brown Zero Town Hall meeting team for um, inviting me to say a few words uh, for this very important program. I think it's a worthy time to have these conversations and to allow citizens to take action for a country that we have none other except our own. Uh, because even if people have dual citizenship, um, whichever country you are in is not a country that you can claim as your own except Nigeria. There are three positive words that come up very closely in the discussion for today. One is corruption, the second is insecurity, and the third is inequality. In terms of insecurity, Nigeria has been rated uh, the fifth least peaceful country out of 163 countries in the world, and that is the rating by the Global Peace Index that came up on Wednesday, June 10, 2020. In terms of corruption, Nigeria is rated 146 out of 180 countries. And this was the report of Transparency International in January 24, 2020. In terms of inequality, 
what we see is a situation where the middle class does no longer exist. Uh, we have those who have and those who do not have. With the global pandemic, it makes things even tougher. Sadly, from being the most happiest country in the world, Nigeria is now the poverty capital of the world. And when we compare this side by side with the potential of this country, it is one that makes us sad, but should not just leave us at the point of despondency, but at the point where we rise from the ashes and look for how we can uh, save our country and build something out of the ruins. Citizens would need to take action and learn to be the change that they want to see and also to demand for the change that they want to see. Um, the Buhari government sadly came on a wing of so much hope for citizens across the country. But that hope has not translated into reality. Um, we could postulate so many viewpoints, but the one thing is that the excuses do not make for relevant authorities today with the view of not just thinking about it as though it were an us against them issue, but to see that all of us, whether we are part of the government or the governed, are part of those who need to make the change process happen. Uh, and so on that note, I'd like to again join the DG and uh, all well-meaning Nigerians to welcome everyone to the Ground Zero Town Hall meeting. And I hope that we would have a successful deliberation and we'll move from not just rehashing the problems, but we'll move to solutions. I thank you for having me. All right, uh, thank you so much, Gloria. Um, I appreciate the time you have for us and you went straight to the point and just touched it where it matters most. I want to at this point in time uh, uh, announce that the president of the Nigerian Union of Journalists in the person of comrade Chris Isiguzo is already with us. Comrade Chris Isiguzo, my president, I want to welcome you to the Ground Zero Town Hall meeting. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, having me on this uh, uh, town hall meeting uh, this morning. I am delighted to be part of it uh, because uh, the issue that uh, uh, we will be taking on today is a very important one, uh, looking at uh, five years uh, down the line of uh, Mr. Pre uh, Muhammad Buhari, Mr. President's administration in the last five years, actually. And uh, we'll be looking at the uh, critical sectors, looking at corruption, the fight against corruption, uh, looking at uh, the issue of insecurity, uh, which of course is uh, a very, very uh, important one. Uh, today, it would agree with me that the nation is no longer secured. It's not about Boko Haram again. It's gone beyond that. If you go to the northwest, you see the banditry. Uh, if you go to the south-south uh, and the southeast, kidnapping is on the high, uh, the southwest. And if you go to central Nigeria, the activities of uh, uh, headsmen and all that. So uh, the insecurity challenge is uh, really uh, something else uh, within this period under review. So it is good that uh, we are gathering this money or today rather, uh, to look at these uh, uh, issues and see how far and how well uh, we've done in the last five years. So uh, I'm happy uh, to be here. I've listened to the last speaker. She's been able to capture uh, some of the uh, uh, statistical data, you know, looking at the, the where we stand in terms of security, where we stand in terms of corruption, and of course, the issue of inequality, and what have you. Of course, she made a very uh, valid point uh, when she talked about uh, the obvious disappearance of the middle class in the country. That is a challenge. We are not talking about uh, uh, the low class and the upper class and what have you. What about the middle class and all that? So the situation that we face today is uh, such that uh, we need to start talking. Otherwise, this whole thing is going to go out of hand. So uh, I'm happy. Uh, to be part of the program and i know in the next one to us we are going to be looking at these issues uh, like she said we are not just going to continue going round and round the challenges we have we also need to come up with the workable uh, solutions uh, so once again thanks for having me thank you 
All right, thank you so much. Uh, my comrade president, Chris Isiguzo, for that wonderful opener. Now that we basically have our openers, so many other persons are joining the meeting. I appreciate you all. Let's now go straight to the real talk. We've still not been able to uh, connect with uh, Dr. Obadia Melafia. So in the absence of Dr. Obadia Melafia, we'll go straight to taking um, Mr. Dasuki, the DG Bureau for Public Service Reform. Sir, you're welcome. It's time for your presentation on the this administration five years the fight against corruption and inequality through public service reforms. DG. Okay, thank you yes. very much, Mr. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Yes, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, in the first place, I want to say that the Bureau of Public Service Reform, as an agency of government, has developed a document that is called the National Strategy on Public Service Reforms. Now, the National Strategy of Public Service Reform is built around four pillars, which are looking at uh, improvement in quality of public service, uh, public financial management, uh, uh, governance, uh, national uh, uh, development plans and other issues around 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 that. Now, in every under every pillar of the national strategy on public service reforms, the citizen is given the privilege or the prominence to participate in governance directly and indirectly. And uh, we are hoping that by the time the national strategy is implemented, the Ni Nigerian public service will be among the best by the year 2025. Uh, I know a lot of people will be saying, how can this, this happen? Uh, those of us that have been around for quite some time will understand that there's a difference between Nigerian public service 25 years ago and the Nigerian public service that we have today. We have blocks of success or agencies that have surpassed quite a lot of uh, uh, international uh, standards that have been looked as example in other parts of, of the world. So by the time we have these building blocks together, we have a, a standard public service that will address issues of corruption, uh, inequality, uh, and all other issues that the public service is meant to address. Now, coming back to the, the topic of, of, of discussion today, uh, it is true, the, federal, the Buhari government came around 2015. And by around that time, a lot of things were introduced by the government or built on what was still existing to fight corruption. Number one was the various reforms around public financial management. Uh, we have been trying to introduce Treasury single account over a very long time, it didn't happen. This government came and said, Whatever the case is, whatever the consequences are, Treasury single account must come. Uh, apart from Treasury single account, BVN was introduced. Apart from BVN, GIF means was introduced. All these uh, uh, programs, all, all these tools were introduced to reduce man-to-man -man contact in the process of uh, in the process of or in processing uh, funds of of government, which is hope uh, or aim at reducing corruption at, at those points. And you agree with me, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that the cashless policy introduced by government has gone a long way in reducing man-to-man -man contact and reducing uh, uh, corruption. Now, apart from that, the government, through the Office of the Accountant General of the Federation, has recently launched uh, an online portal where, going forward, all government agencies will be submitting their daily uh, financial statements online where citizens can see and ask questions on 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 what is uh, what is happening along that line too the office of accountant general have introduced an online auditing system whereby uh, uh, government agencies can be audited without necessarily uh, sending uh, government officers to audit uh, uh, audit their their accounts uh, uh, fiscally so I think these are some of the things the government has, has done around 
public financial management, and there are things we can touch and feel. I say, yes, they are really working. Uh, well, to some of us may feel they are not, uh, we are not there yet, but I think we have started and we have moved uh, uh, very far. The government has also introduced um, the Presidential Advisory Committee against, against Corruption with uh, people of uh, high integrity in that committee, and they've been working to, uh, to help not only fight corruption, but to block and stop avenues of, of corruption before they, they, they even happen. Now, government, this government have also continuously uh, strengthened uh, anti-corruption ag agencies, ICPC, uh, EFCC, uh, Code of Conduct Bureau, NAETI, uh, PCC, and, and many, other, many others. All these have been strengthened to see that we fight corruption, not only fight corruption, to avoid and stop corruption before it, it happens. This government has also introduced uh, efficiency units under the Minister of uh, Finance to block uh, leakages uh, in, uh, in, in utilization of government funds by agencies of, of, of government. I don't have the figures now, but I know a lot of money has been, has been saved. This government has introduced the whistleblower policy, which has uh, been successful and has led to disclosure or reporting of a lot of uh, corruption activities uh, nationwide, though we think this uh, should go beyond where, where we are now. The government uh, has passed the anti-corruption uh, uh, strategy, uh, which is already been implemented by some agencies of, of government as a, a coordinating uh, agency. We are working with uh, other agencies uh, like NITI to ensure that all agencies of governments key into the anti-corruption strategy of, uh, of the of federal government. Additionally, the Office of Head of Civil Service of the Federation, in collaboration with the ICPC, uh, Office of uh, Head of uh, uh, Head of Service, SDF, are working to strengthen the anti-corruption units in ministries, departments, and agencies. They are working under their strategic plan of 2017-2020 to improve on ethics in the workplace and they have been developing anti-corruption uh, prevention form, uh, framework within uh, uh, MDAs. Um, the the zero-based budgeting and a lot of reforms that has happened around uh, budget. Number one, citizens are given the right to participate in budget preparation processes, and they are given the right to ask questions after budget have been passed. Uh, Nigeria has signed through during uh, Buhari's government onto the o o OGP, and though it has not reached where it, it uh, should be, but I think a lot has happened around uh, transparency, uh, freedom of information, and giving the citizens, uh, giving citizens right to uh, participate in anything that has to do with uh, finances by, 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 by this government. And where we have a president that is committed to reforms, a president that is committed to fighting uh, corruption, and I think, and uh, we think, uh, a lot has been done around, around that. Now, I don't know if I'll stop here, Mr. Hayes, or I'll go to inequality. Hello, Mr. Hayes. Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, my DJ, I was with you. I, I am also still battling with this technical, this oh, new okay, norm. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so that is, that is in a nutshell what has happened around uh, anti-corruption anti 2015 to, to, to date, and okay. more, more uh, are on the, on, the, on the pipeline. Okay, now, uh, why don't you, let's, let's also have that of inequality so that we know you have, we have you okay, deliver okay. all of yours at once, then we move on to the group discussion where every other person would come in and add their voices to it. Okay, consolidating and making steady progress on existing reforms through the following. Uh, policy of effective representation of women in government, 
policy establishing gender units in federal ministries, departments, and agencies, gender budgeting policy, women empowerment policy, uh, training programs policy, microcredit for women and less privilege, uh, public works, uh, women, uh, youth, and employment, and the empower programs, national child policy, social protection and safety nets, violence against persons prohibition bill, multi-sectoral action plan, uh, ending early marriage campaign, women in peace and security, women's livelihood and productivity, advocacy and capacity building for women in agribusiness, ongoing review on the national policy on rehabilitation of persons with disabilities, continuous advocacy and sensitization and lobbying for enactment of legislation to ensure full integration of uh, people living with disability into the society and establishment of national commission for persons with uh, disability. Um, proposed extension of facilities at the National Farmcraft Center for the Blind and, uh, and, and many others. Now, uh, one of the, panel uh, the panelists had spoken about uh, COVID-19. The government has come up with a, a, a robust uh, uh, program or programs that will, uh, that will address challenges that have uh, emanated as a result of COVID-19 and going forward on how to empower uh, the, the common man, improve their standards of, of, of living and reduce the, 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 the poverty gap between the haves and the, and the, and the have, haves not. Now, insecurity has been a, a problem. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have not been able to, to fight it uh, to the level that it, it should be. But as, as an agency of government, working with the armed forces, we've been um, uh, uh, into a lot of uh, seminars or workshops to encourage the Nigerian armed forces to do more around Boko Haram and the, the problems in the, in, the, in, the, in the Northwest and other, uh, other insecurity challenges that we have been facing all over the, the country. Governments have on their own spent a lot of money in equipping the, the armed forces. Salaries and welfare packages of the Nigerian armed forces have been, have been improved. Uh, and I think they have, done, they have done quite a lot, but we need to do more. Now, looking at um, uh, insecurity, while government and uh, the armed forces are fighting insecurity in this country and other challenges, we think as a bureau that the citizens must collectively come together and assist these agencies to succeed in eliminating the various uh, security challenges that we have. Uh, recent reports have indicated uh, a lot of connivance between citizens and criminals to perpetrate some of these uh, acts. The recent ones are the ones around North, uh, Northwest where uh, 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 citizens call criminals and give them data and information activities of the Air Forces so that there will be uh, surveillance is done on a, on a, on a, uh, in an area. By the time the aircrafts are on air, you see that the guys have, have, have run away. So that means while government is doing its own, citizens must be more patriotic, they must love the country, love themselves, and we should collectively assist the armed forces to fight this, uh, this else. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. All right, thank, thank, thank you very much uh, the, for this very, very comprehensive presentation. Now, some of the reforms in the fight against corruption that, that you mentioned includes the public financial management reforms, such as the Treasury Single Account, the introduction of BF, B, BVN, the GFNIS, the online portal for NDAs, uh, daily financial dealings, online audit system that was introduced, the Presidential Advisory Committee on Corruption, strengthening the anti-corruption agencies, efficient um, units, uh, efficiency units.
to block leakages and also the whistleblower policy and finally the zero base budget these are some of the points that you said have been put in place to fight or curtail corruption as it were we want to thank you very much it's about time we now invite uh, the panelists let us look at these issues that were raised by um mr dasuki arabi and uh Let's discuss them. I would want to go first to Cosmos. I have to do, Dr. Cosmos, I have to do. Uh, Ulysses to the Director General and uh, his uh, presentation. Looking at his presentation, first, well, I respect comments from you, then you give us your own position in all of this discussion that we are having, looking at it from the bringing in diaspora perspective to these issues that we have raised today. Cosmos. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm grateful to the Director General for uh, reeling out what will be um, perhaps a list of supposed achievements by the government. And I, I make some apology for using the word supposed. And the reason I, I make that apology is because I'm grateful for the progressive approach that uh, this program has taken. But I want to say uh, uh, there are many things that could be said. If I'm allowed three minutes, th then so that my uh, colleagues will be able to chip in. I, I would just take uh, some of the issues randomly. And the reason I'm going to be taking this approach is because we are looking for a solution going forward. Uh, let us look at, for example, uh, the very foundation for the um, establishment of the Bureau uh, for uh, Public Service Reform. Uh, in itself, there's nothing wrong with that establishment of that Bureau. But what um, uh, I, I want to raise as a point for consideration, and maybe other panelists will be able to engage uh, this, is, for example, the proliferation of um, uh, government agencies. Uh, we are, there are no more fully fledged government agencies, but some of them are, they call them presidential tax force, uh, presidential committees. And in the case of this one, now is a bureau for uh, the uh, public service reform, which ought to be an integral function of the office of the head of service of the Federation, for example. Uh, some of them are called commissions. Some of them are called agencies. And there was, um, I think it was uh, uh, Osanoye, I think is the name of uh, the gentleman. I did some research on this. And he was proposing, uh, and Mr. President, I must confess, did something very good here uh, when he first came into the country by trying to look at ways that uh, ministries could synergize. Because of that, ministries were reduced from a larger number to 22, was my understanding, uh, when, Mr. President, this administration came in five years ago. So that was a good way. So one of the things of finding efficiency in the system is to be able to cut bureaucracy. In the proliferation of government institutions, and uh, government offices, agencies, uh, committees, by whatever name so-called, is an additional layer that reduces effectiveness of government. Now, when uh, the uh, very distinguished uh, uh, gentleman, I'm sure as a DG, must be distinguished in his field, was really out a lot of this. A lot of them were policies. I made a note of a lot of things he said, and he, I'm sure he can look in his notes and confirm that a lot of them were policy on that, policy on this. Uh, the whistleblower uh, uh, regime is a policy, for example. This should be more enshrined uh, so that we can have the opportunity for enforcement and evaluation. So this is just one of the things that he said. Let's go into some other things about anti-corruption strategy and policy. I, I'm, not, um, I'm not interested in, in politics here, but I do note that I heard directly from the office of the um, accountant, accountant general of the Federation that uh, 132 agencies 
or should we call them parastatals, the MDAs, were already in the TSA system before this administration came in. So it was something that was in coming in. And I think I want to also give credit to this administration for making it so much more widespread. But let me tell you the problem that I have with uh, the uh, TSA, uh, or well, I don't have a problem with the TSA, but for example, the, 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 the BVN system, uh, everything, th that system can only work where we have no um, identification integrity. The uh, NIMSI, uh, I applied uh, about four years ago for a NIMSI card, and uh, national ID, and I still haven't got it. I can look in my wallet and fish out the paper one for you. So the point I'm making is this. Uh, I've got uh, children that were born in, in this country, in the UK, but I can go to Nigeria and I can challenge the account, uh, Attorney General of Nigeria that I can go to every state in the country and pay 500 Naira and get 36 or 37 birth certificates for my children that are born in the UK. I challenge you that I can do that. Go to 36, 36 states and the FCT and get an ID a birth certificate for my children that were born in this country. The, the integrity of the BVN is based on proper identification. One of the proposals that I tried to, uh, uh, by the way, I worked in Nigeria for four years as, um, uh, as an advisor to the government. Um, and, and one of the things I, I tried to propose, for example, was why is it that a Nigerian can have 10, uh, your, your, you can go to uh, a court, a magistrate's court, and your uncle, you, you can even swear that you are your uncle and that you were born on a certain day and you get by the payment of 500 pounds. I tried this, I tried it personally, I tried it personally in some courts in Nigeria when I came to Nigeria a few years ago. I walked into a court and I paid 500 Naira and they gave me a birth certificate uh, with uh, uh, something else. Why shouldn't we all go, the, we, we have the uh, National Population Commission. Why can't they, if all the banks know who their customers are and they use this um, uh, telephone um, a GSM to identify a customer, and there are no two customers with there are no two customers with two GSM the same GSM number in Nigeria. Why can't we identify the people we have in Nigeria? So that one again is something that is leaking the integrity of your BVN, and this goes into pension scheme. This goes to every. Um, um, government, uh, the last um, administration uh, said we found so many 80,000 ghost workers sometime. And this administration comes and finds another 80,000 ghost workers. Don't we ask ourselves the question, why is this thing recurring? There is recurring because there is lacks in the fundamental institutions and the fundamental um, uh, agencies and technologies. And this brings me to another thing. I listened to the DG on all the reform that he mentioned. One, two areas of reform that he did not mention, one of them was education. I did not hear one thing about education. What is the reform that we have regarding education? In this country, the UK, when they were starting the vaccines for COVID-19, Oxford University is leading it. I'm in the University of Reading, and you go to the webpage of reading.ac.uk, and you see the contribution that institution is making to COVID-19 in this country. The reason I'm saying this is, is that we have to have research-led, 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 I emphasize it three times for a purpose, that research-led um, 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 uh, solutions we have to know what our problems are. Then we go to the fundamentals of it. How many, if we were to find policies in this country, how many policies do you think we're going to find on any one subject about child poverty or about... Uh, it, the, my, my problem is this. It's one of three things are wrong. One is that whether our strategies are wrong in themselves, I don't believe our strategies are wrong. I believe that there is no strategy that we will implement that we cannot achieve a certain degree of, of progress. 
I don't think our strategies are wrong. But the other one is resources. Do we put the right people in the right places? This government has got 22 ministries. And if we take the Minister of State, they've got how many um, uh, ministers? How many of them are, are economists that understand micro and macro economies? Yeah. If we don't have that, then there is very, very difficult for us to start to talk about inequality. In all over the world, it is understood that one of the things that breaches inequality, one thing is first to break the cycle of generational poverty by education, and the other one is to empower people. And I see what they're doing with the um, uh, with the CCT and things like that. I, I know, right. I think you're trying to stop me there, but there's so yeah, much thanks. more that, that we can talk about. And uh, uh, forgive me, let me just mention this quickly. All you right. mentioned about citizen, citizens' participation. If I come to Nigeria, citizens' participation, that I must feel part of the country, nationhood first, before I can feel that allegiance and loyalty is what motivates citizen participation. Uh, let me give my colleagues uh, the opportunity to contribute to this. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Barista, Dr. Cosmas. Uh, let's come to the president. Uh, he's if I'm still on. Uh, he's, we can't hear you. I'm still on, I think. Okay, thank you. Let, thank you so much, Barista Cosmos. Let's come to the president of uh, the NUJ to also quickly uh, make his own contribution, comments, and presentation in respect of the presentation by the uh, Director General of the Bureau for Public Service Reform. And of course, also react to some of the things that we have presented by Barista Cosmos. I have to Comrade Chris Isibuzo, are you with me? All right. Comrade Chris? Well, well, well once again, uh, thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Ahis Agbon. Uh, I've listened uh, to the last speaker, I think uh, uh, Dr. Cosmas, uh, the, that of uh, the DG of uh, BP. SR, I actually didn't get that because of uh, some network challenge. Uh, perhaps if he has uh, something that he prepared, uh, uh, it would be nice for us to also have it because sometimes this thing uh, fluctuates that you don't get to really get things. But I, I really got, took a lot of things from uh, the last uh, pre presenter and uh, I cannot agree uh, with him less because he substantially captured, I believe, uh, uh, the nitty-gritty of the points that were made by the, the DG of uh, Biru uh, for public service uh, uh, reforms. Uh, but my own, I'm going to take it from a different uh, uh, perspective. Uh, yes, the, the DG may have told us about uh, the policies they have initiated uh, which I uh, believe they are all geared towards uh, uh, building a center climb uh, for all of us. Uh, but uh, like uh, the last speaker did say, they are all uh, policies. Uh, we must have to get to the point where the ordinary Nigerian out there uh, begins to appreciate these policies that have been enunciated by the administration. They are very, very uh, important. Well, he also talked about the issue of proliferation. I'm, a, I'm very much aware that uh, the former is uh, head of service of the Federation, uh, the committee that he led on Nasanya committee had uh, recommended that we merge most of these uh, government uh, uh, agencies, departments, and parastatals. Because by the time we continue to uh, proliferate, it uh, continues to breed inefficiency. I also agree with the last speaker uh, uh, on that score because there's no way you continue to have uh, ordinarily one issue that should be addressed by one agency. You have 10 of them addressing the same thing. For instance, when you look at uh, the issue of uh, the police, you have uh, the police, you have the ICPC, you have the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, you have uh, the Code of Conduct Bureau. If you look at the 
the the the the, the, the uh, responsibilities of these government agencies, you see that substantially they are doing the same thing. And uh, we, there is need for us to bring them together in order to encourage uh, efficiency in the system. But like I said, I am trying to take this thing from a different perspective. I believe that for us to get it right in our system, the first uh, step that must be taken is to get the electoral system right. Because it is only when those in authority begin to have that uh, conviction that their uh, power completely resides with the people. That is the only time they will begin to see it that they are indeed our em uh, employees, while the people, uh, are Nigerians, are the employers. But I think that the present situation we have is uh, the reverse is the case, because politicians believe that they would always buy their way through. And uh, when they come to you and they present all those electionary materials, uh, they share you money and you collect, they believe that they have already delivered democracy dividends to you. And when they get to office, they do whatever they like. So there, must, there is this need for us to reform our electoral system. You know, it is unfortunate that up till now we do elections and before you get results, you have to wait for like three days. When in other developed climes, they have gone beyond that level. As you are voting is a matter of hours, results are out. So we must have to address some of these uh, issues. Today, we are still talking about political party primary elections. You see candidates emerging in their numbers. That means we've not really addressed the, the, the baselines in this electoral system. By the time we're able to effectively address this system, I can assure you that most of these uh, issues that we are talking about would have been addressed. Another important issue is that we seem to be building a system where strong individuals are running weak institutions. If you look at other clients, they have built very strong institutions that when individuals come, they only uh, uh, superintend over these institutions. And there are things that they cannot change on their own. A situation where it was completely at the, at the behest of the president to appoint certain, certain caliber of people in this, it's not the best. I recall that at a point there was a national uh, political reforms conference where it was recommended that uh, the office of the attorney general of the federation should be separated from that of the minister of justice. Up to today, what are we talking about? You have a situation where the person that occupies that position is a card carrying member of a particular political party. And what do you expect from him? Of course, he does the bidding of his party. But that is not the way it's supposed to be. And that's why it becomes imperative that we begin to build very strong institutions so that whoever gets to occupy such positions or man such department, you will not veer, veer off from the laid down procedures. These are some of the critical issues that we have. So if you are talking about corruption, fighting corruption, if you have very strong institutions that are saddled with the responsibility of engaging in this fight, it will be easier for us to, to win the fight. But the, 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 the present scenario, I can assure you, is not really working. We must have to start building institutions so that how many years uh, in democracy, 21 or, or thereabout, and we are still talking about the baselines. I want to believe that by now, 20 years or 21 years after 1999, we are supposed to be to have gone far from where we are. But today we are still talking about somebody is coming to tell us that we have built roads. Somebody is coming to tell us about uh, we have built classroom blocks. Somebody is still talking about uh, 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 erosion menace. When other clients have moved away from these issues and they are talking about other things, we are still talking about the, the foundations. We've not even laid the foundation as a, democrat, as a democratic nation. That's the truth. And we must have to begin to lay those solid funds. We must go beyond the level of, we have made this policy, we have made that policy. Now, the last speaker talked about the issue of BBM. Now, if you want to register, get a phone line, from any of the networks, you need to register. You need to go for your international passport. You need to capture your 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 your, your, your biometrics. 
Anything you are doing in this country, they are capturing you. If you go to the police, they are capturing your biometric. What it simply means is that all these things you are doing, they are not working. And there's one thing I'm going to say here now. If you, are, if you go to, let's say, MTN and you're buying a line, maybe the line has been used by somebody else in the past. Now you're buying this line. Even when they have registered the line there in your name, I want you to check out the same line on True Color. You will see that a different name will pop up. And that's the truth. So what now becomes the essence of that biometric that they, they just did with you? It's just a waste of time. You understand? So I think we begin, we need to begin to address some of these things so that we don't continue to proliferate things and we keep going around the circle, yet we are at the same point. We've not made a single move from there. But all in all, I'm not saying that the government has not done a few things. I have not said so. I think that in the history of this country, there has never been any time that a system has shown some level of commitment to the fight against graft than now. The situation, the, the challenge that we have in the system is so much, is so deep that even one administration cannot even pinch it. That's why most Nigerians don't seem to understand that there is, that efforts have been made. That's the truth. But this administration, I can tell you, has done a whole lot in terms of fight against graft. There's no doubt about it. But because the thing has become, it, it, it's like in, our, in the sinews of our bones. You know, that is why it appears it's, uh, nothing is happening. You know what it means when something is, is in your bones. For you to take them out, it would almost take your life. You know, so that is the challenge. But we have to continue to encourage the government. Let us let them continue the way they are going. But let us encourage the establishment of solid institutions that will be able to confront some of the challenges that face us as a people. I think uh, let me pause here uh, while I listen to others. All right. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you so much, my president, comrade Chris Isiguzo. President Nigerian Union of Journalists for your contributions. We really appreciate these contributions. Uh, Gloria will be coming to you soon, but before we come to you, Gloria, let's quickly go and take Charles Sado. And after Charles Sado, Comrade Abdul will quickly also drop his own comment, then we'll come to Gloria. I'm sure thank you happy. very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Ahis. I'm, I'm so honored and pleased uh, and privileged to be in the midst of these uh, fine gentlemen and women this morning. You know, it, it's 4.15 a.m. In, in Minnesota, and I just feel like it's 1 p.m., you know, because uh, these issues are so important, and uh, I, I can't sleep. You know, my colleague, uh, my friend and brother out of uh, the UK, uh, Dr. Cosmos, encapsulated the frustration that we feel when we, come, when we look into Nigeria from outside. Honorable Hiss, you, you, we've known each other for about 15 years, and you know the passion that I have for that country. As I speak right now, I have an office in Lagos that I do business in. I put in about $100,000 run, you know, setting up a small business in Lagos just to get people employed, I haven't gotten $5,000 back in the last five years. Now, here's the issue with Nigeria, you know, because as far as I'm concerned, I will tell you one thing. Yes, the DG, with due respect, sir, you know, um, you, you talk a good talk and, you know, it's smooth and it, it looks you know, verbose and, you know, very, very assuring. But the truth of the matter is Nigeria is the only country where a public officer mounts the podium to give a policy speech. And when he leaves that podium, that speech remains on the podium. You don't, you go back to that office, you can't, you, you don't have anything to anchor yourself on. That has to change, number one. But for me, let me just tell you the truth, though, the way that I see this issue. There are three things that I see here. Now in the United States, you see all the global whatever that is going on. It took place here, 12 minutes drive from my house. Here is where George Floyd was killed, because I live in this epicenter of it. I live in the epicenter of the global, you know, protest that you are seeing that is changing the face of America 
we are beginning to see movements from 400 years of, you know, uh, uh, how am I going to put it, oppression of colored and brown people take some turns. You are seeing monuments come down. That is what the rulership in Nigeria needs to address with the contraption called Nigeria. I love my country. I had the best of my times, you know, living in Bauchi when I was young. And I thought, I think that Nigeria has so much more if we open our minds to what I call a cultural re-indoctrination for us to know what it means to be Nigerian. I'm not sure you have one Nigerian that is going to be able to define what it means to be Nigerian because I don't know. I don't know what it is. We need to go back to the roots of the issues that were papered over when this country was formed in a way that you bring equity into how that country is governed, how its resources are managed, and how we talk to each other. I don't, I don't have to go into the problems because we know the problems of Nigeria already. We are here to talk about solutions. The North needs to understand that the current trajectory that we're going is not sustainable because if you don't have a country, then you don't have anything to lay down. We're almost getting to the precipice. That's number one. Number two, there is a sense of entitlement that comes from the rulership, you know, from the elite, from the people who govern Nigeria, whether it's this government or the one that just came and left, such that, you know, the psyche of the average Nigerian, in my opinion, or by my estimation, because I come to Nigeria four or five times a year because I have a small business there, like I said, the psyche of the average Nigerian is so beaten up right now and it has gotten into nonchalance. You know, you can sit on the Nigerian right now and tell him to bend down, you poop on his head, you will just say, oh, God, day. A country can't move forward when you have a beaten up citizenry that, you know, that are so hopeless, such that they just allow their leaders to rape them with no, no, no hope. We see, the leaders need to sit down and understand that if you are born in Maduguri, you should be able to run for election in Ibadan without, without, you know, qualms. You should understand that the stake, what we have at stake, you know, as a country, is better for all regions of the, of the country if we treat each other with respect, if we treat each other with equity, if we come to the table to say, okay, this is Project Nigeria, we have vested interest in it. And I'm gonna say the third thing that encapsulates or wraps everything up is the rule of law. I'm pretty sure that my, my, my brother in the UK is a lawyer and he's gonna understand this. Look, the problems in Nigeria from my perspective as a process management expert can be looked like a fish bone. You have that rib in the middle, and I mean, you have that cord in the middle, and then all the problems rip off of that cord, right? So you can, when you pick one of those ribs, you can trace that problem back to the rib, and the rib of the Nigerian problem is the rule of law. You cannot have a society without respect for basic simple etiquette with basic simple jurisprudential i mean i'm just i'm just picking my 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 hair off my head right now with the impunity impunity itself is is corruption sense of entitlement itself is corruption non-challenge itself is corruption so when you we're talking of COVID-19 now. How many press conferences has President Muhammad Buhari given to the country for reassurance? So, you know, for me, those three things, particularly the rule of law, we, we got to come together and say, okay, we're going to be governed by rules. This is a nation that is going to set rules and then we'll be governed by them. If you have rules where nobody feels like, you know, they are above you know, uh, 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 the law, then people will have things that will cut them to order. You know, if you are going off the tramp, you know, off the ramp, you know, we're going to call you, put you before a judge, they put you in jail. If you know okay. you're going to spend time in jail, then you're going to know how to behave. 
a country where the rich get away with a whole lot and then the poor people are the ones that suffer is not a country and we're not going to advance. So those right. are my three things because I know there are a lot of people up here, but I'm not going to take your time too much. Okay. The rule of law, we must address the sense of entitlement and the non-challenge in the society as well as the contraption of call Nigeria must be addressed from a position of equity. You can call it true federation, you can call it for me. I probably say we've reached a state now where you can create eight sister countries out of Nigeria so that we can start afresh. Much as I love my country, I'm, I'm willing to go to that extreme. And then I yield my time. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Charles Sado, for your contributions to our discussion. It's about time we bring in Abdul Bako Usman, President Campaign for Democracy. Right after him, we'll be linking up to Gloria Balasin for her uh, own contributions. Abdul Bako, the mic is yours. Yes, it, it's, it's a pleasure and uh, I must profoundly appreciate all speakers before me because uh, they've said enough. And uh, I, as my starting point was, it, this is a forum where we honestly tell ourselves the truth and I am happy people are venting out what is honestly uh, the perspective we found ourselves into. For me, my lenses on this regime for five years will look inward and start with leadership self-esteem. Uh, it is quite unfortunate that uh, there is a lot of a uh, missing link between leadership and followership in our uh, in our nation today. Can we truly concur that President Muhammadu Buhari knows and is providing leadership for us in the right direction today? And for our benefit, do the leader, President Muhammadu Buhari knows what is good for us as a people? Because the essentials of the true leadership of self-esteem is the discovery of needs in a secure direction for followership. But today, a lot is missing. Let me go back to uh, the DG uh, Bureau for, for uh, public reforms. He has this administration for the past five years have put in place. But it will interest you to know that uh, there are certain institutions that are saddled with the responsibility of, uh, let's say, the fight against uh, graft, the EFCC. The EFCC today, as an institution, you agree with me that the law that constitutes the EFCC says six months into the financial year of, uh, uh, of uh, the financial year, the EFCC should tender its audited report before the National Assembly for onward disbursement or for onward consideration for its, uh, its budget for next year. But that is not applicable. Today, the fight against corruption has become uh, a selective fight where uh, we will take the rhetorical as expression by Mr. President and say, I belong to everybody and I belong to nobody. There are certain people that really belong to the president and there are certain people that uh, don't really belong to the president. Take, for instance, the NNPC, the internal, uh, the internal revenue uh, 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 institutions. Take the, the, the central bank on issues that have to do with IPPIS. Those reforms are supposed to be holistic. They are supposed to be generic. But today, certain institutions that are government institutions are taking off such issues like the IPPIS. They are considered to be okay, uh, revenue generating uh, bodies that are, are not supposed to be part of it, which is very terrible. So a holistic reform should carry everybody along and uh, be willing to, 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 to give the Nigerian citizens a holistic 
inward uh, perspective that will encompass everybody, not a selective one. The fight against corruption, it will interest you that uh, just prior to the 2019 general elections, a lot of things happen, and we are very, very critical of it. People wrote to the EFCC saying, okay, they had bullion vans pre-elections day roaming the street. Nothing happened. Again, on the 31st of July, precisely on ground zero, we were trying to x-ray the ministerial take a bow and leave. It will interest you that a minister came up on board and was saying that his grandson, his grandson, asked him, why are people calling you liar? So immediately our talks went to the likes of uh, uh, the Ezazaki, 3.5 million naira feeding. So the rhetorical statements in this administration regarding the fight against corruption, regarding uh, regarding uh, the, the the security uh, fights, are more on board than having it fully on ground. And as uh, the NUG uh, president rightly said. Building of strong institutions is what we equally need. But such institutions already, the policies and the administrative works are done there. But impunity, nep uh, nepotism, high-handedness, and uh, lack of, uh, uh, lack of uh, having uh, the believability in we as the leaders, that sent duty bearers to preside over us is making people feel okay, they are above board. Okay. If not, elected members are supposed to be answerable to we, the electorate. But today, revise is the case. They feel the, uh, the alpha omega of everything. And I think if our institutions are not strongly built towards the handedness, we will supreme. It put. This could lead to a lot of negative tendencies, if not addressed. Okay. But first, let me explain the ministerial position in our country today. There are certain clients and certain uh, indigenous people that are not even respected, they are not even represented, they are not even being represented at the, at, at the highest level of government decision-taking body. Take, for instance, the indigenous people of the federal capital territory, the, the federal capital territory, they are completely neglected and they don't have any representative in the executive council. So issues around inequality has been a factor that needs a serious legislation that should anchor our direction towards uh, having an effective uh, 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 balance in our system. The Federal Character Commission that is supposed to be the supreme body of checkmating those excesses will agree, you will agree with me that uh, has failed us completely and that has subjected us to issues of impunity, has subjected us into issues of high-handedness, has subjected us into issues of nepotism, tribalism, and sectionalism today. Okay. So going forward, going forward, the yeah. only way we could address this as citizens is by building those strong institutions and making sure priorities are being uh, are being adopted and that those who are found wanting should face the cost of the music. All Thank right. you. Thank you so much, Abdul Bako, Comrade Abdul Bako, President campaign for democracy. Okay, now let's now come to Gloria Balasin from the House of Justice. And uh, Gloria, would want you to, because most of uh, our panelists have been talking about um, uh, inequality and corruption, and they've not really been talking about uh, insecurity. I would want you to look at the angle of uh, insecurity and how the actions of government is either helping 
to reduce it or increase it as the case may be. Gloria. Thank you very much, Ahis. Uh, let me lend credence to what Dr. Cosmos and Comrade Abdul Bako Usman have earlier on said. I think this, the point to make is that we need more than form, we need substance. Because because we cannot buy the process more than, out, more than the outcome. So in terms of insecurity, uh, and this is an area that really breaks my heart, become a country with very high threshold of lens. So across the country, and before the area, what we had as uh, the, the plus point of insecurity was the Northeast. But right now, the, the, the whole of the North, and other parts of the country, the south, and every they deal with different issues. If it's in the northeast, we call it Boko Haram. If it is in the north central, we say herdsmen. If it is um, in the south south, we say they are called killers or they are kidnappers. We have a way of giving it a name. But you see, I, I don't think that you know it. It's fair on the citizens for thinking about insecurity. What exactly can they do? Because the questions we haven't asked ourselves about this insecurity problem in Nigeria are the things that we probably shy away from. So for instance, we need to ask ourselves, the people who come in to shoot in the middle of the night, the Rattag Army, are they the owners of the AK-47 and the vicious um, kind of uh, ammunition that we see? Mm -hmm. I think we can best imagine what the answer to that question is. And yet this is a country where we invest billions and billions of naira for insecurity. We say, okay, we do this high budget so that we can have security and the, what we get at the end point is even more insecurity. And we need to ask ourselves questions like, who are the sponsors of this insecurity? Who are the instigators? Who are the perpetrators? Who are even the collaborators? If we have a secret service, these are things that we should know because no country loses people in the numbers that they do like we do in Nigeria that is not at war. So we have become a country where violence has become the order of the day and violent crimes have, taken, have become also what we are now um, accepting as our new normal. Kidnapping is a very, uh, paying uh, industry now. Now we have a situation that is just too scandalizing the fact that people are raped left, right, and center. Children cannot even be protected. It's, it's, it's really uh, uh, unfortunate. So we need to ask if insecurity is a new oil well. Because my sense of this is that insecurity in Nigeria is not going to end until no one is benefiting from it. So if we're having security votes, we need to know where the money is going to. And we don't want them saying, oh, this somebody has gone to the Northeast, somebody has gone to the Northern Central, people have, uh, soldiers have been, when all of that is done, what is the outcome is the issue? Have we been able to secure our citizens some more? Have we been able to make our roads safe? Because uh, right now people cannot even travel. So insecurity in, in, in Nigeria is something that uh, the, the Buhari government really needs to look into. I believe many things vote for, this, uh, for the Buhari uh, team because they were hoping that they could keep safe. We have had citizens and even the National Assembly calling time and time again that the service chiefs should take a bow because we, the, the effect is not being felt. And even when you're playing on, on a football field, sometimes you change the players because what you want is that at the end of the day, you win. It's not just to say, oh, that the player played hard. So uh, this part of the, the aspect of insecurity especially needs to be checked so that we can move from this point where citizens cannot even sleep in, in, in the dead of night. Moving from there to the issue of corruption, uh, the DG spoke about the fact that this uh, dispensation, the Buhari uh, administration has shown commitment to anti-corruption. Now, um, is this the same anti-corruption fight that we have the Attorney General asking for the EFCC chairman to go? Is that what we're talking about? Because you see, again, you can, you can have 
various anti-corruption agents, whether it's NATI or the Code of Conduct Bureau, the ICPC and the EFCC, if it translates into less corruption, then there's a problem. Uh, we have gotten to a point in this country where we need to get back to the basics. We have to teach what is right and what is wrong. Because we have become um, a people who think that there are no absolute. I wouldn't go so far as to say that, that corruption is in the bones of Nigeria. I honestly do not believe that because this is a, a country of good people, of capable people, of determined people. Even those who have abusive relationship with this country called Nigeria, they move out of the country, and yet their heart is here and they wish for more. But the question is, as citizens put in all of this effort, what do they have in return? As a lawyer, I have represented more activists than I have seen the prosecution of perpetrators of what is wrong. And that in itself is problematic because when you continue to do that, you persecute um, activists, what you do is that you kill the power in citizenship. You kill also the ability to, 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 to place a demand. And someone said earlier, and ask the question, what does it mean to be a Nigerian? Under the Buhari administration, the people have lost their sense of feeling of Nigerianness than I have ever known. Because if you set up a government and you have people from a particular part of the country more in that dispensation, then you kill the, the feeling of commitment to that country. So inequality also has to speak to the issue of poverty, and education, which Dr. Cosmos spoke about. Um, our education sector needs to be revamped. It needs to be a policy that every child needs to go to school. So if we have a chapter, mm -hmm. a chapter two of the constitution, like we do, that speaks about the uh, educational objects of the country, and it says, oh, it's a policy that children should go to school, then these things need to be done. Uh, there needs to be creation of jobs as well. But still going back to the, the, the issue I flagged earlier on about what is right and what is wrong, you can imagine that in this pandemic situation, it's either they're scheming a scam or scamming a scheme. So they say, oh, there's palliatives. But these palliatives find their way back to the markets. People who don't need them are the people who have them hoarded in their homes. You know, there are votes of monies, but it's not even translating to a reduction in the, in the infection rate. It's not even translating in, in, in the numbers that we should have of testing centers. I think that beyond the titles that we have, we need to just be able to take some time out and remember that we are human. And that the period in which we live is a period where we must make the highest impact, no matter what our roles are. So my call would be to the Buhari government, but more especially to the national agency. They have so much work to do. They have more work to do of orienting, of orienting people about what, what the real values are, because this country has to be built on principle. We cannot continue to just run off the meal and take it as it comes mm -hmm. and become content people about the problems that we have. It is okay. people who create problems, and it is also people who can solve problems. And I think that Nigerians have what it takes. All right. Thank you so much, Gloria. There are so many issues that are raised here, which we, we also talk about. But while reflecting on that, I'll go to Femi Adi. Uh, Gloria, I, I, you recall that recently the immediate past deputy governor uh, apologized to the people from your constituency, Southern Kaduna, over the frustrations that they faced while he was in leadership and couldn't do anything about it. Now, he's not in power. Is it that he sees things differently? What would be your comment on that? Maybe after that, we'll go to Femi Adi. Femi Adi, you have to coordinate the general question and answer session for us in this uh, particular town hall meeting. So Gloria, so you after them to Femi. So, you know, uh, without trying to get to uh, mm -hmm. to personal details about this issue. It's the same issues that happen every now and then for people who occupy political offices. Um, it's someone that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolute studies.
You know, when people elect, when citizens elect leaders, what they do is not to elect you for excuses. We, you would make us promises and say, oh, that you can deliver. And both are on the strength of those promises. And so I, I think that uh, uh, the former deputy governor, is the, is, he stands as a metaphor for many politicians who do not make the most of the time that they have in the office. And they just believe that, oh, at the end of the day, that people are going to accept excuses. Nigerians see, Nigerians feel. Nigerians understand the issues. And no matter how we try to mystify what the effects are, people will continue to see. So if you make excuses, for instance, about insecurity and also after you are out of office, what you want to do is to try to uh, 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 give us reasons why you were frustrated. Nobody is going to admit that you had demonstrated the fact that you were capable of of solving the problem. So I think that the, the Bantex metaphor is the same metaphor that should apply to us to not give us excuses. What Nigerians need is for them to be able to go to bed and sleep at night. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Gloria. Let's now come to Femi Adi. And in this session, so many questions have been raised in the chat panel. And uh, for those that will be interested in answering or making comments, you just lift, raise your hand in the chat section using the emoji there, and we will activate you. So, John Femi Adi, of course, I know you do your own opening statement, then you coordinate the question and answer session for us. Over to you, Femi. Yes. <clears throat> I've listened carefully. My name is John Femi Adi, the Secretary of Energy Kaduna chapter and um, the publisher of um, Daily News Times. I quite appreciate every contribution today. Quite interesting, quite educative, and um, of course, for the first time, we, we are talking across the world, across the country, with uh, persons ordinarily we cannot meet. And uh, big thanks to COVID-19 for creating this platform for us to meet each other. Uh, I speak across the world. Uh, I'd like to ask, you see, I, I've been listening. Uh, I want to, I want Gloria Ballesin to, please, you talked so much about insecurity. And this has always been the narrative. We keep talking, we keep talking. In clear times, in clear times, because you, you did mention, I remember in your opening speech, that uh, we should be talking solutions. I'd like you to categorically come up with those roadmaps and solutions to the problem of insecurity from what you have perceived from the way and manner this government has handled it. Gloria Ballasin, please. Uh, so I will not lay expertise to security, but I will speak from the standpoint of a citizen and someone who is really concerned that her countrymen and women, and especially children, are being killed and poured in mass graves. And, and this is from wherever. Sometimes we even have the state as the perpetrators of these killings, when you want to talk about the Shiite killings, for instance. And for me, the, the, the first, the way to go would be one, the security votes need to be scrutinized. We cannot have a situation where security votes are unaccounted for. Then again, when one person is killed anywhere around the world, investigations are carried out. We want to find out what is the story behind the killings. Was there someone who sent, was it an assassination? What is the form? Uh, a DNA is taken and what have you. A lot of things come into play. But when people are killed in numbers in our country, they are just reduced to statistics. And it's unfair because it's somebody's father, it's somebody's mother, it's somebody's child, it's somebody's everything. So the same vigor with which we put to investigate the killing of one life should be the same vigor that we put in, in investigating for every single life. And we must be a country that look out for our citizens. You see, if you're in government, you may have the state security apparatus around you. But the truth is that the apparatus will not always be around you. So you are as endangered as we are. Only, the only difference being the uh, uh, time. So in, in that sense, we need to really be invested. And I think more citizens need to be able to raise their voices wherever killings happen. One of the sad things that I see about the killings in Nigeria is that when it happens in the north, it's a northern problem. When it happens in the 
in the south is a southern problem. But this is a member of a human family. This is a member of the Nigerian family. Wherever these killings go on, we as citizens should be able to raise our voices and say, no, we will not accept this as our normal. Okay. I'd like to go to Dr. Cosmas. You did mention during your presentation about um, the absence of macro uh, appointing the president, appointing ministers and some persons without the knowledge of micro macro economics. I remember you did say that. How, how, what um, would you, as a person, as a researcher, come up with as the model for tackling corruption that is endemic currently in the country? Um. Well, I think uh, so, somehow there seem to be two questions, but I, I wonder how um, uh, perhaps there's a link somewhere. So if you say yeah. tackling corruption in the country, there is yeah. what I consider to be a very simple model. A lot of people think sociologists, psychologists, and I think it is something that is pervasive in the way the uh, uh, one of uh, our friend from America spoke about the psyche of the country. So some people think that when you're over a certain age of 30, 40, you are beyond redemption in the, your outlook to life. What I would say is this. When I was in school, I did my primary school, my secondary school, my first degree in Nigeria. So my primary school was in Surulere in Lagos. So I, I went to St. Finbas College, St. Gregory's College, local schools. There, weren't, uh, there wasn't uh, the government, the federal government schools like King's College. But in all these schools, we had moral instruction. We have civil instruction. At that age, we were being taught what was good, the, the difference between good and bad. So I would say go back to the curriculum primary school curriculum, secondary school curriculum in Nigeria, and make sure that there is infusion of these concepts of what is right and wrong. If it's become something that is so pervasive in the country and so chronic, don't you think that going back to the roots and teaching young people from nursery school, primary school, in Nigeria, there's no, as far as I understand it, no pre-school educational policy that I've seen introduced anywhere. Everything starts from uh, primary one at six years old. But overseas, there's preschool where they start to teach them fundamental things about that, that builds into, so it's a building block, all the education that you go through and, and it's kids like that. So that's one thing. Let me tell you another thing. It's about language. I speak Yoruba better than you, Femi. I'm Igbo. I come from Igbo State. My wife is from Ogun State. So I speak better Yoruba than, than most Yoruba people. I lived in Ibadan all my life. My, my nephew happens to be the, the, the uh, um, um, is, um, uh, um, uh, speaker or your state house of rep. The mother is my sister. So the point I'm making is this. That language, because my sister married into a family there, She's more, you wouldn't know she was evil if they didn't tell you, you know, your state today. You wouldn't know she was evil. You wouldn't know if I go to a Lagos state and uh, Ogo state. You wouldn't know that I'm, that I'm evil. So the point I'm making is this. I think one of the greatest legacies for integration in our country was when uh, the General Gowon instituted NYSA scheme. I don't know the many thousands of Nigerians that are married across tribes. This should also be brought into the schools. In England, if you are in secondary school, you must learn a foreign language. It might be German, it might be French, it might be Portuguese, it might be Spanish, but you've got to learn a foreign language. If I was in Nigeria today, in any capacity as a minister, special advisor, president, governor, I will ensure that in my state, in most state that I come from, that Yoruba or Hausa is an elective, a compulsory elective. There was a time when I did Waike in 1983, we were the Ghanaian, Ewe, Chui were, 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 were subjects that you could choose. And those are Ghanaian languages. 
Why can't we use? And imagine, and I've been told this, I think it's a famous quotation from Nelson Mandela. If you speak to a man uh, um, in his language, you speak to his heart. So what we're doing is we're all, so I think those are fundamental things. I don't want to go into the more structural things like local government <laughs> But when it comes to the uh, finances, for, for forgive me, let me go to this because I may not have the opportunity anymore. Um, in India, they found out the woman that sells Akara, if you help that woman that sells Akara to also make pap to go with the Akara and bread in the morning for breakfast for people going to work, that is the woman you ought to empower. They did this in India and it transformed the economy of India. It totally transformed the economy of India. That woman is the woman that knows how to put aside 1,000 naira every day. And they never, they always pay their rent because she has a job, a susu, by whatever name you call it, all over uh, the Nigeria. And they put aside 1,000 naira every working day. And that woman has 200,000 to pay her rent at the end of the year. She doesn't default. Those, and for every small scale that empowers, that just, gets two or three more people, we will have an employment we'll have in Nigeria in, in three years. So those are, that's uh, the, and, uh, the, in the economic recovery uh, growth plan and things, these are the things we want to see. It's been tried, not the conditional transfer uh, money they are given. They tried that in Brazil, it worked because they made it conditional that women must bring their children to the hospital, the ticket before they give them money. Your children must go to school, then the ticket before they give them money. It ought to be a conditional, conditional fee. A conditional, yes. Be, yes, conditional. So if every woman that is the backbone of the women in Nigeria say, if all your children under 16, if you can show us the report card from their school that they've gone, then we give you the money. They, you are breaking generational poverty by making sure everybody is going to school. If you say for you who is breastfeeding, you must bring your antenatal and postnatal up to six months, then before we give you this money, then it reduces infant mortality rate. The strategies must be right, then we put the right resources, then have the right implementation. Nigeria can be transformed in three years, I believe, if we have Thank the you very much. will. Thank you, Femi. Thank you very much. I'd like to go to the energy president, if you're online. Are you online, Mr. Energy President, sir? Um, if he's online, I just like to ask the role of uh, the media within these five years that uh, Buhari has mounted the podium as our president. I'd like to know who the energy has played to ensure that um, we clear ranks of corruption in this. Case. Well, uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much. Before I go to the, the role media, uh, I want to uh, concerning the first question, which of course you asked um, Gloria, uh, which uh, uh, deals with security. In our, of course, it's possible to also guide us through uh, uh, some of uh, losses we daily witness within the system. And uh, I must tell you that uh, she took it completely out of my mouth, you know, because when we said, uh, for about one month, we tried it now. A journalist was uh, uh, reportedly a number of things. And uh, to this point that I, I'm, I, I'm talking to you, nothing happened about it. Who took him and the way they come from may have been heard. As uh, we are uh, on in this meeting, I got a call from a boy in the States that at about seven o'clock this morning, the man of Jerry, of journalists in the States, was, uh, uh, will I say, abducted or arrested or kidnapped? We don't even know the, the, the country. Some men came where he was uh, having a walk to the wife. And uh, they stopped and uh, they were from IG. And the victim has it. Now, there's not, uh, we were told that they took the wife to go to a man. Our men, my colleagues, have gone to a man. 
And somebody there received people, Moses. Mm -hmm. But now, who are they? I don't know they are having ID cards. I don't know where they came from. The police came from my And see the kind of system where this people into the end and are You know, at this point that we are talking, nobody knows anything about who came, who abducted him. And that boils down what Mother Boya. That uh, 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 laser bay, uh, so to speak, a major challenge we have in the security system. Yes, we agree that uh, security is uh, responsibility. It requires collective responsibility. All of, all of us must have to be involved. Citizens must have to be involved. Don't just leave it in the hands of police uh, and what have you. Yet, but the most important these people are paid with payers, and it is best of all their responsibility to do that job, to discharge that, 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 that responsibility. What I get in our call for a total overhaul of the next security architecture, and no better than now, you to overhaul the agency. The military, the police, down the down the radar, people start facing the, the problem of insecurity in this country. Every other day, I men in the east, in the northwest, and we seem to be helpless. So urgently, of course, to be. So what we do, of course, I know that section two and thirteen, our constitution. Impose enormous responsibilities on the media. We are supposed to hold government accountable. And number two, in that enough, we are supposed to enjoy access to our country. freedom of the press, free press. One of the unique ingredients of democratic governance is right of the people to express themselves. Anytime we pigeonhole those rights, anytime we stop people from expressing themselves, we have indirectly undermined the democracy. And that's the truth. So I can tell you that holding government accountable, the media we have not uh, we committed to that is not just on the values of the program. The media, there is no time to have had a robust media in this country than now. There is no time. We, we now have it. You see the online, for instance, at the bottom of Delhi Times, and we have so many online forms in there. But in the you get the stories from there. But I must tell you, that when it comes to issue of safety and security of journalists, it has remained a major challenge. Not just peculiar to this administration in Nigeria, but Africa. That's the truth. Journalists are not free. As I'm speaking to you, in Zimbabwe, the president of the journalist union is in detention. The journalist union president in Burundi has, in fact, he, he, he had to run away from his country. As I speak somewhere in Kenya, on Eza, the same thing is happening across most African countries. And we seem to be confident about it. You know, so talking about the role of the media, I can tell you that we are very much alive to our responsibilities. And I don't time we've continued to assist government where necessary. I recall last year, I led a delegation to President Mahari, and led members of my executive, and we had an interaction at the State House, and we had an Indian interaction. And we made it clear to him that you are the chief of the armed forces. You are the president. Box your table. No matter how it looks at it, that rise to this responsibility, you must rise to this challenge. 
Players are no longer safe. We must come up with fresh strategies. We will not continue to do one thing over and over again and expect a different result. We must come with a different strategy on how front deadly must are called in security. You are not now go to Katina, not just uh, go to Katina, go to his own place. That should tell you the level of challenge we have in that area. So this is the time for government to be alive to its duties responsibility. As for the media, I can assure you we prepare at all times to make sure that we continue to inform Nigerians. We reject Nigerians. We continue to mobilize Nigerians at all times. Like what a is today gathering people from across Nigeria, across the world, across the world. How do we have a better system? How do we build strong institutions? How do we get the electoral How do we make lives safe? That's what we're discussing here. So people are not bothered. That's why I stress so much on the issue of electoral. By the time you sit down with some of our political leaders, I call them actors because I don't really agree when people say they're leaders. You get very close to some of these political actors, you will be so disappointed with what you will discover. That's the truth. I don't care about you. And that's the reality. So by the time we get the electoral system right, I can tell you so many of these challenges, problems, they will now come to the reality that mandate within the mandate of the people. And any time the people decide to write, that of course we need to give up those mandates. Now, if you go to our council, our rule very, very clear that a lawmaker who has deviated from the, 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 his assignment of lawmaking, that there are process of recalling such a person. Between 1999 till date, has this single person lawmaker been recalled? It is just that, but nothing can happen. Nothing. Okay. It's very difficult. So we must have to start discussing. Let's, this, let this, this is not be a one-off thing. We'll continue to talk. We'll continue to talk. Anytime we stop talking, democracy takes flight. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Comrade Chris Isiguzo, President of the Nigerian Union of Journalists. I would want to, uh, at this point, uh, announce that um, Dr. Obadia Melafia has been able to eventually join us. Like I said earlier, Technical um, issues might have been responsible for him not being able to join us earlier. Now that he's with us, I would like him to introduce himself to us and maybe just an abridged version of uh, the, 20, the initial 20 minutes that we had allotted for your presentation. Maybe we'll just take like five minutes because we are really running out of time. Or will the house graciously allow us to give him 20 minutes? Just show of hand, with a show of hand, how many minutes do you think we should give to Dr. Obadia Melafia? Five minutes? Is five minutes okay? Or ten minutes? Can I just take ten minutes? I, okay. I, I okay. For technical reasons, I wasn't able to join you. All right. So I wouldn't want to um, either eat or simply take time for the sake of just taking time. Um, All right, please so, take ten minutes. Okay. Thank you so very, very much. My very serious apologies. Due to technical reasons, I wasn't able to join you early. Uh, but thank you. Thank you indeed for having me. And um, congratulations to Invicta FM uh, for organizing this whole meeting, which I consider extremely important. Uh, for the very reason that Unfortunately, we don't have a government that really engages with the people. Uh, you know, in civilized democracies, you would expect 
uh, a president to go out there and with journalists face on face to go there, meet with intellectual face to face, take them on, engage with them. All our young people, they are the majority. If democracy is about the majority, the young people should be put at the forefront because they are the majority of this country. I see nobody engaging with them. I see nobody dialoguing with them face on face, listening to them, identifying with their problems and the rest of it. The internet is freezing off. Oh, okay. Okay, please go go ahead, please. Uh, all right, thank you. Let me just um, yeah. So this is also more why I consider it extremely important that we have this kind of dialogue. Um, we should not really be talking about the achievements and failures of any regime, uh, that simplifies things. Governance and leadership are much more complicated than that. Instead, we should be talking about a SWOT analysis of the regime. Its strengths, its weaknesses, its opportunities, and the threats that happen both in the local environment in the neighborhood and globally as a whole. I think this is a sort of conversation that uh, promises to illuminate really what is happening to our democracy or what has been happening to our democracy uh, for the last five years. In terms of the strengths, number one, this government came in with, a, the Buhari administration came in with a lot of goodwill a lot of goodwill. People saw them as representing change. I think that um, the PDP uh, had, had become this monstrous behemoth that was steeped in the culture of immunity, of, of, of impunity, and did not care. So there was massive corruption. We can't run away from that fact. So it came with a lot of goodwill. Number two, you had a president who had a good reputation in the past as a Mr. Fixit, someone who was a patriot, who cared about the country and wanted to see it go forward. So that was an additional asset that the government came in. Thirdly, it was a broad coalition made up mostly of the West, and, and, uh, uh, and the north, and a few elements in the east. So you could say that it had a national outlook. These are all its strengths. And they positioned themselves as progressives. You know, the All Progressives Congress, they saw themselves as progressive. All of that, I think, added to the goodwill. This were among the strengths. And they had been a long time in the wilderness. It teaches you humility. It teaches you discipline. So I regard it as a strength. But for the last five years, what have been the weaknesses of this uh, administration? To be very honest with you, in 2015, it, is, it seems very clear to some of us now with the benefit of hindsight that they did not expect to win and that the victory took them by surprise. And so they came unprepared. It was the great American Secretary of State, a distinguished Harvard professor of government, uh, Henry Alfred Kissinger, who said famously that political office taxes intellectual capital. You can't learn on the job. It's too dangerous to say you are learning on the job. 
and for our president, he came in with the views and the outlook of the 1980s, which are totally different from, from the digital industrial civilization of our 21st century. He's a dinosaur from a bygone age. He had no business being in government at all because I don't think he understands the issues. I don't think they were prepared to govern. That is why it took them six months even to form a government. Look at Boris Johnson in December. The day he was sworn in as prime minister, he announced his cabinet. He was ready to hit the ground running, as the Marines would say. For heaven's sakes, Nigeria is a country of over 200 million people. You cannot gamble with their destiny. You cannot joke with the destiny of 200 million people. Either you are ready to govern or you know you are not ready. Don't push yourself in if you know you don't have what it takes. That is the truth of the matter. In terms of the, so they, they, they took their time even second time around, they took their time. And what did they bring? They brought all politicians and so on. There was nothing new. They had no plan for the country. They had no vision for the country. That is the truth of the matter. And the, the old book says that without vision, the people perish. There has been no vision till now for the country. And that is why it is based on ad hoc policy making ad hoc governance, you know, trial and error. Sometimes there's a lot of incoherence. You don't know who um, is supposed to be doing what. And even the first lady, and I'm not the one saying this, the first lady has made reference to a cabal. She's always talking about the cabal, people who are unelected who are the actual people calling the shots. And it's on record that they could even overrule the commander in chief. That is an established fact. God bless his soul. I was quite friendly with him, Malam Abbekari. But there were several occasions in which he overruled Mr. President. So in fact, he became de facto the president. They could overrule him. They could veto him. For heaven's sakes. If you make me president tomorrow, God help you. The buck stops with me. I'm not a dictator, I'm not a tyrant, but don't be deceived with this soft voice. I'll fix this country. Anybody who's standing on our way, I will just crush him and kick him out. Not, not kill him or whatever, but you've got to fix this country. You've got to make things move if you're president. The buck stops with you and with nobody else. You can't bring your relations from Dora and your cousins and everybody, and they have power and authority to overrule you and to, to, to and, and they are ignorant idiots who know nothing. You can't run a government like that. This is, this is the problems facing this country and this administration. Are you here of, of uh, you know, uh, the president's group and another, the ladies' group, you know, exchanging fire? In Nigeria of the 21st century, this is not Italian mafioso. This is the Federal Republic of Nigeria. If you have to run a government, you must show leadership. You must show moral fiber. You must show focus. And you must present a common front with your family, with your relations, with your party, they will all rally behind you. You are moving, moving forward in the battlefield and they are following you. This is what Alexander the Great did. This is what Julius Caesar did. This is what Abraham Lincoln did. This is what Mahatma Gandhi did. So what kind of leadership is this? You don't engage with the people. You are this shadow figure that stands behind. People are not, don't even, even, some people even say you are not the one. What kind of thing is this? This is exactly why, what Ghana did. They said that they don't even know who the president of Nigeria
Nigeria is so they don't mind demolishing your, your embassy. I heard those stories in, 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 in Ghana. Yeah. So, and then look at the lawlessness. I'm concluding now. Look at the lawlessness, the chaos, the killings on a staggering scale. Innocent people, women, children, the elderly, the infirm. It used to be mostly restricted to the middle belt, whom we believe they wanted to make into a gigantic huga for foreign Fulanis from Mali, from Chad, from Niger, from Guinea, from Futetoro to come and settle in, dispossess the people, commit genocide and take over the lands. Many of those lands have been taken. Hundreds and thousands of villages have been taken and nobody has been arrested. Nothing has been done. But now it is spreading to uh, Zamfara, Berningwari, even Katsena, the home state of our president, and the result. So it has become a national catastrophe. Nigeria is on its deathbed. Nigeria is bleeding. Nigeria is agonizing. I speak as a patriot, as a young man who used to play sports with a, a gallant officer by the name of General Muhammad Buhari. 1982, when I was uh, just a young fresher, after NYC, I was working in NIB school. So I have nothing against him. Actually, I love this man. He's a fantastic person, as a person. All right, sir. Uh, hello? Your system seems to have frozen off. OK. Well, uh, the, 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 the 10 minutes is taken. I was hoping that in just a minute, you address the issues of reforms around insecure inequality. OK, uh, we lost him. OK, let's now come to rounding up all of this. I will go back to. Um, the DG Bureau for Public Service Reform. Having listened to all of these comments and contributions from the different panelists, and also looking at your presentation, and generally all participants looking for a way forward, what would be your reaction to some of these comments, a couple of them, because I know you cannot react to all of them, there are so much, just the ones that are most important, your reactions to some of them, and uh, all looking at going forward. That's uh, maybe in uh, three to five minutes, if you okay. would permit right. us. I thought you'd give me 20 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a wonderful day, a lot of experience. We have had uh, quite a lot. Uh, number one, I want to start by responding to Mr. Obadia's um, uh, attack on, on government, which I think was a little bit uh, personal. I was uh, hoping to engage with him, being an academician and my senior in the service, on a lot of uh, topical issues that I can carry forward to my office on Monday and add value to, to our discussions. Uh, but anyway, this is the a forum for all of us to express our, our feelings, and he has done his own. Now, Madam Gloria was talking about uh, insecurity. I said in, during my opening that uh, insecurity is really a problem in this in this country. Uh, but where she ref uh, ref uh, referred to uh, Northeast, uh, I think those of us from Bono State and some uh, Northeastern states will agree that Though we are not there, some uh, success is being achieved. And uh, we're hoping that citizens, especially of those areas, will cooperate with the armed forces and provide information on uh, 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 saboteurs that live within them so that we'll be able to crush Boko Haram and I I ISIS within the shortest uh, possible time. Now, let me get back to my friend, Dr. Cosmos, who was uh, quite uh, uh, academic on all what he said. Number one, the Bureau of Public Service Reforms is not supposed to remain under the Office of Head of Civil Service of the Federation. We are supposed to be independent. We are leading reforms in all federal government agencies. While Head of Service of the Federation is leading 
the operation and management of the civil service. Uh, this is not a Nigerian one-off uh, uh, operation. Uh, there are countries that we used to call Comprado countries. All of them, with the support of World Bank, uh, DFID, uh, in, you know, from United Kingdom, where you are, uh, contributed uh, to the development and, uh, of Bureau of Public Service Reforms. Uh, it's only a pity that uh, because of um, some reasons at home, the Bureau has not been able to be where it is. But if you look at PEMEDO, PEMEDO started almost the same time with Bureau of Public Service Reforms. And if you look through literature, you can see how PEMEDO is performing now. And this is where we hope to be. Uh, our roles, our responsibilities, mandates are entirely different with Office of Head of Service. And we don't see that as in spirit of this uh, implementation committee. So as you follow us on our Twitter and website, we'll be updating you, oh, uh, we'll be updating you on implementation of um, Oros Anye white paper, which is aimed at reducing uh, agencies and reducing duplication of responsibilities. Treasury single account and BVN, as far as we're concerned, as a government agency, they have worked and they are working. We have just started, uh, but for the few months that we have started, I think something has happened. Uh, I agree with you that uh, TSA was on before uh, 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 this uh, government. For your information, TSA has been on since 2004, when we commenced the first uh, trench of public service uh, uh, reforms. Uh, but no government has come with this bold move to say, every agency of government must be on, on TSA. Uh, BVN is there, it is working. Uh, I'm not disputing the issue of identity, but if you are following developments of, in Nigeria, you can see that the government has said the database of NIMSI should be the database of all government agencies that are searching for data. Uh, this commenced uh, 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 last year, an ecosystem is being developed among ag government agencies on, on data. So that if you are going for renewal of your passport, uh, they will request for information on national identity. You have national identity, they just cross over and collect your data. So we have just started. We want you to be patient with us. We are confident it will be there. And NIMC is linking its database to all uh, centers for birth uh, certificate registration. And this is, again, why we're calling for uh, community support for government uh, policies. Uh, IPI, IPPI is fundamental, it's good. It has led into uh, bringing a lot of sanity in, uh, sanity in management of uh, payroll, in management of the data of public servants. We started, B, uh, BPS has started IPPIs in six pilot ministries. Today, we have virtually covered all agencies. Uh, my comrade uh, friend mentioned CBN, FRS. No agency as directed by government is supposed to be off IPPI. So implementation is in progress. And I'm assuring you that every person working for government of Nigeria must be and is going to be on IPPIs. Unfortunately, the, acad the academic community that are supposed to be our leaders in this crusade are the ones fighting uh, uh, IPPIS. Um, we thank you, Comrade Charles, for your for your commendation on what we have done. But uh, 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 electoral reforms, we did not touch electoral reforms because it's a little bit off what we are supposed to to be discussing. Um, but we are discussing with the uh, INEC, and uh, very soon I think we will come up with uh, information on what we are doing or what we think they should do to uh, reform uh, election in Nigeria, especially digitalization of reform, reform processes in Nigeria in line with the approved e-government uh, uh, master plan.
uh, as I said, we have a leadership that is reform-minded, that is committed to reforms. We are calling on all Nigerians to support us, to encourage us, to encourage the president who uh, Obadiah referred to somebody that is, that is sleeping, but is really interested in, in, in reforms. We don't have any other nation than Nigeria, and we cannot do it alone. So we are happy that we have a forum like this where we are engaging, we are discussing, and all the comments that have been made here, we have taken note of them. And as somebody said, in BPSR, we come up with policies and we ensure that these policies are implemented. Go back to the first national strategy on public service reforms and the work plan of BPSR 2004-2005. All the items itemized there have been turned into policies and they've been implemented or have been implemented. We thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for this opportunity. Talk to us to exchange uh, ideas and information. And I'm assuring you, we have picked the good bits of it. And we'll individually get back to you uh, to see how we can get more information on what you think we can do better and what you think we should advise Nigerian government to do better. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you so much, DG Dasuki Aridi, uh, for these uh, beautiful presentation and response to some of the comments that we have raised at this point in time. Saxon Ahide is um, with the Guardian newspaper. Saxon, you have a question or two for any of the panelists before we go? Saxon, are you with me? Yes, I have a question. All right, Saxon, please go ahead with the question. Yeah, good. I have uh, actually listened to all the presentation was quite but my question now goes to the civil society representative there who is comrade Usman you see uh, in the last five years of Buhari's administration in this country we've witnessed a lot of insecurity social imbalances in the system and even in terms of the welfare of the people are not quite well met. And labor in society in the past have been the pivotal of protest against injustice in the country. But today, the labor unions, the civil society groups have remained docile look at other countries look at the uh, other clients the developed clients in the world you will see their people being gingered by their labor by their society group to challenge the government's essences so that they put the government on to why is it not so today under Barry's administration hello Hello? Yes, Sanson, the, the question is directed at Abdul is Usman, Major Lee. Abdul Usman. So let's unmute Abdul Usman now. Yes, Abdul Usman, you can uh, 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 respond to those questions from Sanson. Yes, uh, before I respond, I would like to say uh, welcome on board, uh, Dr. Obadia, and uh, you are welcome. Uh, yes, uh, Saxon has uh, rightly portrayed a point that with the advent of uh, this uh, dispensation, with the mantra of change, most of we, the civil society and labor union, haven't seen uh, the commitment of government into the open government partnership, bringing citizens and government duty bearers on board to actualize uh, good governance, we felt, okay, we are going into the right direction. 
it must not be street protesting that will be engaging government through its machineries, through its institution to really get what is right for the citizens. But some little pockets of uh, such demonstration has taken place, which you can equally say, you can equally accept to from the last one we had in Katina, where uh, some of our comrades were even uh, uh, invited by the police. And today, let me be emphatically clear with you that the Nigeria of today, under the leadership of President Muhammad Buhari, is more or less survival of the fetus. And the, and the dying of the less suitable, for indeed, the center is no longer holding. There are a lot of our comrades, just the way the president of our, the Nigerian Union of Journalists say, there are a lot of our comrades that we don't know they are aware about. They came in in the night, picked them up, and it is like that. For example, Dadieta, the lecturer comrade in uh, a uh, federal university. Up to this moment, we don't know his whereabouts. So it's the survival of the features that we are engaging and holistically will be engaging, as the case may be. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Abdul Baku Usman, uh, for responding to that. But meanwhile, Saxon, I am going to arrange for us to have a more comprehensive interview with the DG Bureau for Public Service Reforms, because I know you have quite a number of questions and issues that you'd want to get from him. So DG, I will arrange uh, for a chat with Saxon. He is with Guardian newspaper. Saxon. Thank you. Thank you. Well, okay. Thank you. It will be okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh, I will now come to Prince Chimaroke. He is a communication officer with Accountability Lab. Prince uh, Chima, if you are with me, would like you to quickly also add your voice to the conversation because we'll be rounding up any minute from now. So Prince Chimaroke. We are coming over to you, Prince Chimaruke. We are coming over to you. We are unmuting your microphone now so that you can also give us a goodwill message and parting contribution from your end. Prince Chimaruke. Okay, we are trying to. Yes, Prince Chimaruke, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we I, can. I, I, good morning. Good, good morning, Nigerians. Um, thank you. This this town hall meeting has been really, really insightful. Um, great, great discourse. Um, I would just want to say, um, I would like us to begin to move from uh, um, just having. Um, the discussion to make plans with which, um, no matter how small they are, with which we can begin to uh, possibly make steps towards achieving all of these things that um, we're actually um, discussing here. But I believe that collectively we can um, join forces and begin to do a it's from our different places. All right, Prince Chimar, okay, thank you so much. We will also want to get a com uh, we would like to get a comment from Gloria Blues from Bridge That Gap. We'd like to get a comment from Gloria Blues from Bridge That Gap. And after her, we'll come to Abel Adejo from our pair. Gloria Blues, are you with us? All right. Hello, everyone. Good um, morning. And um, sorry I came in late, but 
but um, I'll be following chaps with the meeting. And I'm glad I am a part of the town hall meeting. And I look forward to more of such um, meetings. I'm very sure it's, um, it's worth all the time and the trouble. So thank you very much, Ahiz, and all the team that prepared this uh, meeting. I look forward to another uh, another one very soon. Thank you. and. All right. Thank you so much, Gloria. From Gloria, let us, uh, we have uh, Estefanos and Abel Adejo from Pell. We'll take Abel Adejo from Pell now. Let's get your comment. Abel Adejo from Pell. Abel, are you with us? Abel Adejo. His mic seems to be muted. Abel Adejo. Okay, we cannot get him. Abel Adejo, are you with us? Yes, okay. I'm here. All right, I uh, will get your parting, parting words. Abel Adejo is from the uh, the uh, partnership for uh, to partnership to engage reform and learn pair and it's uh, uh, so just introduce organization yourself and give us your party show. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Ahis. Um, I work with Partnership to Engage, Reform, and Learn in Kaduna. Um, Partnership to Engage, Reform, and Learn has three pillars. The government, the pillar that works with the government, the other pillar works with citizens, and then we have the one that uh, uh, look at evidence tracking to interrelate what we do across locations. We work in about seven locations, FCT, uh, Enugu, covering the southeast hub, Lagos covering the uh, southwest hub, uh, Kaduna, Kano, Jigawa, the partner states, and then we have the northeast um, team completely. So I, I think this has been a wonderful uh, session today. Um, I've just been listening to all the presentations and all the things, because for everything we are looking at is for citizens to get good governance around and across location wherever they are. Track the budgets, try to see how the budgets are utilize and how effective they are for the citizens because on the long run if public officers are elected and are not held accountable they will not be able to as a matter of fact um uh, listen to the yearnings and cries of people across uh, locations so for this i think it's very important when people pay taxes what are their taxes used for so the citizens can hold government to account in respect of their taxes on the issue of tax for service when they pay their taxes, they can also look at it to ensure that health care services are provided. When they pay their taxes, they also ensure that education uh, is also accessible to everyone across the country. So it's uh, been a very good discussion. And um, the media are in the forefront in all the things we do, because if the media is not tracking and then we're also following the media to ensure that we track whatever media are also doing will not be able to get effective reporting and then how we can hold government to an account so i want to commend everyone that had done presentation on this one and also to say that this town hall meeting is very important very useful and thank you for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you so let's come to barrister uh, dr cosmos ayakudo and this one, we are just going to, for you to rate for us the performance of Buhari five years on corruption, insecurity, and inequality. You will just give us your rating on each of these sub-departments on corrupt, that's first on corruption, second on insecurity, and third on inequality. What would be your rating? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Joel. I'm uh, very used to marking. It just finished the marking season in the UK. So um, it's very hard to score A, except you've done excellently. Um, I would uh, mark, um, to be honest with you, the government a very weak passes uh, um, for corruption. And I know that is a very big task. But looking at the resources that have been in, 
um, how strategies have been implemented, the continuity they propose with the, the heads of services staying on and everything all put together, the intelligence gathering, I'll give them a weak pass for corruption. Uh, for insecurity, uh, to, to be honest with you, uh, that would be a fail because it's a failure of both the strategy, I think, it's a failure of both uh, uh, the deployment of uh, resources and it's also a, a failure of implementation. If, uh, if that was a student uh, 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 giving me a paper, I would call that a fail for insecurity. And then for inequality, I think uh, that, 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 that will be because of the economic quick a recovery plans because of the strides that were made uh, in the budgets and uh, you know it's not just throwing money at it because of um, I know there's been a lot of borrowing and a lot of people think that you know the borrowing is not bringing it but altogether I, I will give that a pass I will give that a, 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 a fair pass of 50 percent because of the uh, when they came in the price of oil what has now happened in the past uh, a few months, you know, I would give that a pass, uh, right. but I think it's a weak pass also. So okay. no, no bright colors there for the government. I'm sorry. Okay. Let's come to Comrade Chris Isiguzo. He's also going to do his rating after that we'll move to uh, Comrade Abdul Bako. Well, since Comrade Abdul Bako is already unmuted, let's just take Comrade Abdul Bako. After that, we'll go to Comrade Chris Isiguzo. Yes, Comrade Abdul Bako, in these three departments, or these three areas, what would be your rating? Quickly. Oh, for security, uh, it has, uh, the system has failed us woefully. I haven't seen that even in the corridors of power, where if, if there is a, sh a shootout, you know, okay, there's an overthrow of government. That is the presidential villa. We had one not quite long, where the okay. SA uh, run for his dinner. So I think uh, for inequality, inequality, I, I believe uh, high handedness and nepotism, sectionalism mm -hmm. is much of me too. I mean, it's, uh, it's a fair, it's a fair. Yeah, it's okay. a total failure too on that Many aspect. And uh, for, 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 for fight against okay. corruption, you will agree with me. Yeah, will you agree with me that uh, if who is saddled with the responsibility to uh, recovery loot has been questioned about relooting such loot, I think uh, it will also spell doom. And the rhetorical statements and of all experts that are coming from government uh, 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 personnel, okay. the, the large of uh, 13.5 for feeding of uh, El Zazaki and uh, 14 for feeding of uh, image daily. I think uh, I will equally read them uh, as a uh, fail in that aspect of uh, corruption too. Thank you. All right, Abdul, thank you so much. We'll come to Comrade Chris Isiguzo to also give his ratings of the performance of Buhari in the past five, Buhari's administration in the past five years in the areas of corruption, insecurity, and inequality. Okay, Comrade Chris. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have uh, uh, the views that have, uh, we, I have so far expressed, I think have uh, substantially captured uh, about the, the rating I, I have about the administration uh, regarding uh, the issue of insecurity, corruption, and inequality. I think they have uh, been made very clear in the area of insecurity. Uh, no doubt uh, we need to up our game because uh, what uh, presently obtains is not the best that we should have. And that's why I called for an overhaul of uh, the nation's security architecture uh, to be able to face the realities, uh, confront the realities that uh, we have in the system at this point in time. The administration, okay. I would not say has failed because uh, at a point, I was in the Northeast. In fact, I had to uh, uh, go on a tour of that zone. I visited the six states of the zone. I went by road also, and I did that deliberately. Uh, Bauchi, uh, Bornu, uh, Yobe, Gombe, Adamawa, and Taraba states, six of them. And uh, 
By the time I saw firsthand the situation there, uh, it dawned on me that uh, the government has not completely failed because uh, 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 they are also doing a whole lot there. And the, the Boko Haram issue, at least within the period I visited there, which of course was earlier this year, uh, had been downgraded. Uh, but it does appear that uh, somehow they are still uh, operating in some areas. For the government to have been able to recover about 14 local government areas that were ab initio held within the Boko Haram uh, authorities. Uh, it simply says a lot of what government has done, but uh, it's not who yet. Government has got to also up the game in that area. Then in the area of anti-corruption -corru uh, fight, I've also made it clear earlier on that uh, the government is sure doing something because if you get very close to the system, you would uh, appreciate what the government is doing. But because the problem has become so deep, it's deep-rooted that uh, it requires a concerted and a consistent effort uh, for us to be able to uh, take Nigeria out of the doldrums as regards corruption. You know, like I said earlier on, it does exist in the sinews of our bones. At every sector, you see those that uh, are involved in, in corruption or corrupt activities one way or the other. So government has got to also uh, uh, be more committed when sometimes you see people say that uh, it is selective. But there's one thing you must know. Uh, if there are 100 criminals and uh, you've been able to take care of uh, two persons, whether and or not they belong to your enemies, you have reduced the number by, by two. It's now 98. So whether selective or not selective, it means that people are being, are being held. You know, so that number cannot return to the system. You have taken care of them. By the time another administration comes, we'll also accuse them of being selective. And I can assure you, they are not going to face those that have been taken care of. They will also remove another number of people. So with time, these things will uh, fizzle out. It's something that we need to imbibe as a lifestyle, okay. you know, and begin to fight it. In the area of inequality, of course, uh, the lower class and upper class, that's what we have. The middle class is gone. I think the government has got, got to be more open to those they lead. Those in authorities must have to be more open because it, it appears we have so much secrecy in the system. The people must have to come to terms with what is really happening within the corridors of power, you know, and uh, so that uh, Nigerians will appreciate that they have government, they have uh, at least to some extent put in place. So it is work in progress. It is not a one-off thing. Is a work is work in progress. We we'll continue to make efforts at every little corner where we have found ourselves. We must have to make contributions. I recall what President uh, Olusegun Obasanjo said during the, 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 the time he held sway as a president. He said that if you wake up in Sokoto and sweep your house, and the man in Umwahia wakes up and does the same thing, the man in Obomosho does the same thing in Oyo State, another in uh, in uh, Kalaba or Akwaibom does the same thing. And every one of us does the same thing at our different homes. Nigeria clearly will be clean. So it's not about pointing fingers. It, it requires collective effort, collective responsibility for us to take Nigeria out of the woods. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Comrade Chris Isiguzo, the president of the Nigerian Union of Journalists. We are really running out of time. And uh, at this point in time, I'd like to uh, invite um, da uh, Danjuma Abbas Dangwa from Melafia. Is... Okay, is Melafia still on? I can't see. I'm here. Okay, 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 okay. Your computer name is what I can see, and not your name. That's why I got lost. Okay, now, what would okay. also be your rating of the performance of the Buhari administration in five years, looking at corruption, insecurity, and inequality? <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I cannot be limited like that. I started <laughs> my career as an academician. I rose up to the position of associate professor and head of department at, Reg at um, Regents Business School in London before joining the African Development Bank. 
So I'm used to grading students and rating them. Uh, I will tell you the story of uh, of of uh, John of George Bush, younger the younger George Bush. He went to a school called uh, Phillips Exeter Academy in Massachusetts. Are you hearing me? Yes, I am. And uh, he's a first year student, uh, Topil in the Phillips Exeter. By the way, it's the best boarding school in America, in the whole of America. All the children of the elites go to that school. And mm -hmm. young George was not a serious student at all. He was always running up and down, doing pranks. He wasn't studying at all. So he wrote his first essay, and this teacher looked at the essay. In fact, it was English, but it was not English. So he couldn't mark it. All he could write was, if there was something that lower than an F, I would have given it to you. But unfortunately, in the grading system, there's nothing lower than an F. I am sorry to say, sir. If there was anything lower than an F, I would have given this regime. See, the first duty of government, the very first duty of government in political philosophy, from Aristotle and Plato to Ibn Khaldun to Gladstone to the greatest political statesman of the world, the first duty of government is to secure the common peace. Any government that fails in that elementary tax, task has failed. So I am sorry to say this government is a capital and complete failure. It cannot keep the peace. I'm an economist. Look at all the statistics. We are the world capital of poverty. Our infrastructures are in shambles. Lawlessness everywhere. No one is secure. The country has no purpose, no vision, no direction. We're here talking like children. Talk to the senior people in Afenifere, in Ebola and the rest, uh, in South, uh, you know, the, the South South. Let me tell you, they are all thinking of how to break away from this country. I don't want Nigeria to break away. I don't want the country to collapse. I, I love Nigeria as, as it is. I want this country to become a great nation, a progressive nation. But what we have today is an apology. It's a disgrace. Don't try to to whitewash it. Don't even try to whitewash it. If there was anything worse than F, they deserve it. I rest my case. Okay, I'll say those are uh, very very harsh and tough words. And uh, I it's because I love it's because I love Nigeria. I'm not gonna lie to you. I love Nigeria. Yes, I'm not yes. gonna lie to you. I want I wanted to say that I wouldn't be very happy to be your student. <laughs> <laughs> because your grading skills are quite steep. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm very, very hard in my, in my marking grade. Yeah. My wife was my student, by the way, after she married me. She was my student. I Let me tell you, I used, to, I, used to, I used to reserve the worst grade for her because she's my wife and she must do better. Wow. I'm telling you the truth. That's oh. me. That's, that's my own philosophy. Okay. Uh, before um, I invite uh, Danjuma, to give the final parting words of this session, would like to, uh, the DG, Bureau of Public Service Reforms, not to respond to any of this, but to give us a word of hope, because as it stands, you are the only government person that is with us today. So what's that word of hope that's coming from the government to Nigerians? We, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ehez. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, our distinguished uh, guests uh, on, the, on the platform. Despite the uh, minus F given by my senior brother, uh, we are hopeful that things will get better. As Bureau of Public Service Reforms, we are daily working around the clock. As I finish this, this, this meeting, I have an engagement in our office, uh, coming up with policies and programs that will guide government. Uh, government is not sleeping. Government is not insensitive to all the accusations and all the problems that, that we have. But I want us, as we go home, to remember that beyond government, there are followers. 
and we collectively are Nigerians. And we have to support this government, uh, join the uh, cultural reorientation that uh, Dr. Cosmos uh, was, was talking about to see that how we can individually put on our, our, uh, our corners in, in good shape. Once we, we individually put our corners in good shape, and these building blocks will come together and improve the, the nation. So we're here, we're providing service, we're hopeful that it will be better. Thank you. Thank you so very much. So uh, I'll now invite uh, Danjuma Abbas Dangwa from the Coalition of Association of Leadership, Peace, Empowerment, and uh, Development, CalPen. They provided so much backbone for all of this engagement. I would say uh, I do not have enough words to appreciate them. Let me invite CalPen now. They are a civil society organization and advocating for good governance. Um, Danjuma. Yes, over thank, you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Um, we appreciate the effort Ground Zero and Novita FM have done to this engagement. We are thankful for bridging that gap between local civil society and uh, the for uh, public service reforms and uh, are blessed with what the strategies are in helping uh, uh, nation building. At this point in time, we want to also appreciate uh, the participants and civil society in their partners that you will continue to support and advance the cause for uh, good governance. The time the DG have spared to share with us uh, so that we are on the same page on what government is desiring to achieve. We thank you all for the fair criticisms and uh, uh, hoping that we will actually have action points to champion more robust advocacy uh, that Nigeria uh, and citizens both Right. For, uh, are hoping to all right uh thank you so much oh, you, Abbas Dangwa, for all of these i want to individually appreciate everybody that has been a part of this and for the time that you have invested in this town hall meeting that we held today it shows indeed that we all are passionate about developing and growing our country, Nigeria. I want to thank um, Dr. Obadia Melapia. How I wish it wasn't the technical issues we had earlier, you had prepared something for us. But that notwithstanding, this is just a first. It's something that Invita FM intends carrying out every month. Every month we'll pick up key issues within that month and we'll organize a town hall meeting like this where we'll all come together and talk about it. Of course, and they, please, please, I'm not so harsh. I'm not such a harsh person. It's just that the, the, what I'm seeing in our country and the suffering of our people breaks my heart. I'm a village yeah. person. I go to my village, and the suffering is so much that you feel like, you know, I don't know. So that is why my heart is broken. I love this country. I love all the corners of this country, all the religions, all the tribes, all the cultures. I love them, and I want the best for our country. That is why I'm so, so, so stiff in my grading. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and uh, to the GG Bureau for Public Service Reforms, thank you so much for the time invested in, in this town hall meeting. And what we have gotten from this today will definitely be upscaled to the regular radio program. All that we are doing, we are going to stream it on all of our platforms on Invicta FM and also on the Ground Zero uh, platform. We'll stream all of them and we'll pull out takeaways and a whole lot of media persons have been here today that will also upscale it and use it in their various medium. Thank you so much, DG. I'll now come to my uh, I'll come to my president, the Nigerian Union of Journalists, Comrade Chris Isiguzo. I know how busy your schedule is that I was able to 
and twist or hijack you to come. It's actually a miracle. Comrade, I thank you so much for the time you have invested in this uh, discussion today. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. It's good that uh, we'll continue to talk, you know, uh, about our country and uh, come up with uh, workable uh, solutions to this country belongs to all of us and uh, we must have to make it work for us, you know. Uh, so I really, really appreciate this and uh, be assured that I will be available at any time you want me to still be part of your program. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And to Dr. Cosmos Ayakudo, I want to also appreciate you for having time to be on the on this uh, particular meeting. I also appreciate the fact that you have an extremely busy schedule that you can make out three good hours just to provide solutions to the Nigerian problem. It's indeed a sign that though you are far from us, but your heart is still very much here in Nigeria. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Cosmos. All right, bye bye. And uh, Abdul Bako Usman, I want to also thank you for having invested so much time here. So, Femi, John Femi Adi, Secretary, Kadna State NUJ uh, Chapter, NUJ Kadna Chapter, I thank you. And to my chairman. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. All right, Abdul. My chairman in Kaduna, uh, in the person of Comrade Yusuf Adamu, I also thank you. And to other partners, not forgetting Gloria Balasin from the House of Justice, thank you so much. Um, Gloria Bulus from Bring That Gap Initiative, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Free thank you for Maroke. having us. All right, Christine Maroke from Accountability Lab. Thank you so much. And every other person, you are so numerous, I cannot mention all the names. I see you, Istifan Osakau, Ango Bali, Lawrence Obewe, and uh, several other. Yusuf? Okay, Bill Keys. Okay, Bill Keys, Yusuf, yes, she's been with us since. Uh, Bill Keys, thank you so much for having time to be with us in this. I think Bill Keys. Yes, Bill Keys. Okay, the OKC. And every other person. I thank you all. By four o'clock later today, we are going to be on ground zero. And the takeaway from this particular town hall became in some part of what we'll be talking about on uh, ground zero at 4 p.m. today. And between now and then, like always, I will say. Plant a tree today, water it, and watch it grow. Whatever your labors and aspirations in this noisy confusion of life, let us keep peace with our soul, with all its sham drudgery and broken dreams. It's a beautiful world that we live in. Be careful. Strive to be happy. I am a his advocate.